um, I see that there are um, already 112 um, participants for this conference. Um, it's just marvellous um, that despite um, the, the turmoil of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and lockdown, um, that uh, we now have an opportunity to gather together to talk about this very important topic. So um, let me start. My name is Sarah Bidolf, um, and I'm the director of the Asian Law Centre at uh, the Melbourne Law School at the University of Melbourne. Um, and um, this initial uh, short session, introduction and instructions, um, I will be co-hosting uh, with my friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Leila, Le Leila Chi, um, who is um, from the Vietnam uh, National University School of Law, Hanoi. Um, so um, firstly, um, I, as I'm um, located here in Australia, um, I would like to acknowledge um, the Indigenous owners of the land upon which um, I am sitting um, as we have this meeting, um, and that is the Warawurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, um, and extend um, my respects to all um, Indigenous people who might be participating um, in this forum. Um, firstly, let me very warmly welcome all of you um, to this conference. On behalf of myself um, and also the Dean of Melbourne Law School, Professor Pip Nicholson, um, who unfortunately uh, was required to chair an, another um, important lecture this evening and couldn't attend. Um, this conference um, is uh, the co-production, if you like, um, of four institutions. Um, so Nottingham University School of Law, um, the um, School of Law at Vietnam uh, National University, Hanoi, um, the International Organization of Education and Research, um, and the Asian Law Centre at the University um, of Melbourne. Um, uh, it's marvellous to be able to have a collaboration um, of this sort um, with prestigious um, uh, universities and research uh, institutes from around the world. Um, I would also like to introduce um, to you uh, the, the, the person who, um, if you like, has control of the reins of this uh, Zoom meeting, and that is Catherine Taylor, um, who is the manager of the Asian Law Centre. Um, Catherine, of course, um, is the person who makes this go behind the scenes, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, all of her work over many, many months um, with our colleagues um, to get this conference going. Um, might I direct you um, to uh, the chat function at the bottom um, of your screen. If you click on that, um, you will see that Catherine has already um, put some instructions and helpful tips um, in the chat um, for you um, to help you get access um, and to uh, remind you of the protocols um, for this uh, conference. Um, if you have a problem um, with um, interpretation or access, um, if you would pop a question in the chat, um, then Catherine will be alerted to that um, and will assist um, in um, solving it um, for the best we can. Um, but let me now turn um, to Dr. Uh, Leila and Chi, um, who will introduce um, the conference um, from the Vietnamese side and the Vietnamese participants. Uh, Dr. Uh, Leila and Chi, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, dear distinguished uh, colleagues and friends uh, from Hanoi, on behalf of the NAU team, we warmly welcome all participants Welcome all of you to our conference today. Uh, it's our pleasure to collaborate with the Asian Law Center, the Universities of Melbourne, Australia, the Law School of the Universities of Nottingham, and our partners from the International Organization of Educators and Researchers, IOER, to co-organize the conference. And now, uh, flipping through the agenda, you can see there are over 25 presentations sent to the conference, and now we have more than 100, 100 participants. Uh, it means that 
the conference topic is attractive and receiving the common concern of scholars, practitioners in various jurisdictions around the world, but not merely within Asia. Uh, with respect to Vietnam, we are also invested um, in life in prison penalties and its story in other countries, as Vietnam is in the tendencies of narrowing the death penalties. So life imprisonment may become the most severe punishment in the penalty system. Uh, the forms of life imprisonment, the categories of offenses with the sanctions can be imposed, uh, the possibilities of paddles, pardon, and commutation, the treatment of uh, life sentence prisoners, the interest of public safety, etc., need to be examined and discussed in terms of legislative and practical aspect, especially in the context of globalization, the world is fatter, but it but also respect the diversities among nations. Uh, so from Vietnam, we like to introduce the presence at the conference of not only leaders and professors of VNU-RX, uh, but also a wide range of our college from more than 20 law schools and institutes. Besides being here with us, are participants from national parliament, legislator, uh, criminal justice institution, lawyers, and others. Uh, amongst them, there is the presence of Professor Dr. Võ Khánh Vinh, former president of the Vietnam Academy of Social Science, former director of the Graduate Academy of Social Science, uh, Professor Dr. Trần Văn Độ, former vice president of the Supreme People's Court, former president of the Central Military Court. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Now I give the floor to Professor Sarah Pidov to continue the opening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now it's my great pleasure um, to um, invite uh, Professor Dirk Fansal Smith um, from um, the uh, Nottingham University School of Law um, to um, contribute his welcome um, and to introduce the participants from Nottingham. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, all participants, um, from early morning in Nottingham, it is absolutely delightful to be at this conference. I am, can't tell you how pleased I am that it's happening. We're particularly grateful to Catherine Taylor and uh, to Zhao and uh, our colleagues at the Vietnam National University. This combination of Nottingham, Melbourne and uh, Vietnam gives us a remarkable spread together with the other supporting organizations. And um, as a professional, it is a particular privilege for me to be uh, on behalf of the University of Nottingham. When we started organizing this conference, I was still head of the law school in Nottingham. Um, I've now recently retired, but I'm passionately working on this subject. So together with my great friend and colleague, Dr. Catherine Appleton, Catherine too, um, is not physically in Nottingham anymore. She's now based in Trondheim. But thanks to the wonderful technology, um, it is still possible for us to work together. The study of life imprisonment is my passion, and I suspect Catherine's too. I heard her say recently that between the two of us, we've been working on this topic for 50 years. Um, and one of the challenges has been that when we started, there was really nobody else interested in this. I well remember going to uh, New York in the late 1990s, setting out to write a book on life imprisonment in the US um, and saying, well, let's look at what material you have. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, there was not a single book on that title in the Library of Congress. And I failed to write my, my initial book. Anyway, I persisted over the years and together with Catherine, together with many others, um, we produced um, our first attempt, uh, Life Imprisonment, a Global Human Rights Analysis, in which we actually try and look at life imprisonment in every country in the world. And I would urge you to look at it, not only because I want you to read the book, of course, but because we would be so interested if you can tell us where we've gone wrong. We tried our best. We tried to indicate, and we have tables in the end, including every, every Asian country, 
which says what we think. Do you have life imprisonment? If so, what kind of life imprisonment? I know from discussions I've had even leading up to this, that people have not always understood what we're trying to do. And of course, we may be wrong, but that's the challenge. That's the thrill of scholarship. And that's with all the horrors of COVID, that's one of the things that I think has worked in this area. It somehow seems much easier to organize these events, particularly when we have such wonderfully efficient people as Catherine to support us. And um, therefore we can come together today, uh, in the next couple of days and not only uh, present papers, but I hope also find time to talk and to clarify. The area I, can, I cannot emphasize enough is very important. We've reached the stage where in the world, life imprisonment is more often the ultimate penalty than the death penalty. But that's not the only reason for studying. It is really an interesting, complex topic. In some ways, studying capital punishment is simple. You, you, you impose a sentence in which you say you're going to kill someone for the crimes they've committed, and then you either do it or, or you don't. With life imprisonment, you'll see there are subtleties. There are subtleties about even what it is. There are subtleties about release and so on. So I'm really looking forward to the session. Thank you very, much, very much for coming. And um, in, I hope you will all enjoy the um, two days with us. So from early in the morning in Nottingham, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, um, might I um, introduce and welcome um, the, the Dean of Vietnam National University Hanoi School of Law, um, um, Associate Professor uh, Anne. Um, she is actually um, an Associate Professor specialising in civil law, um, in civil procedure, marriage, family and intellectual property law. Um, might I say that we're enormously grateful to Professor Anne, um, who has uh, been such a very strong supporter of our collaboration um, and our ongoing collaboration. So uh, let me invite Professor Anne um, to deliver some comments. Well, xin trân trọng cảm ơn giáo sư Saras Bidap. Um, kính thưa các quý vị đại biểu, kính thưa giáo sư, giáo sư Saras Bidap, giám đốc trung tâm luật châu Á của trường đại học luật, trường đại học Melbourne. À, kính thưa giáo sư Dick Van Zyl Smith, trường đại học uh, luật, đại học, uh, trường luật của đại học Nottingham, uh, United Kingdom. Dr. Marites uh, de Olia, President of the International Organization of Educators and Researchers. Professor Dr. Võ Khánh Vinh, a former Vice President of Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences. Professor Dr. Dr. Trần Văn Độ, a former Vice President of uh, Vietnam Supreme Court, uh, experts, uh, scientists, and delegates to the conference. First of all, on behalf of the School of Law of Vietnam National University, Hanoi, as a co-organizer of the conference, I'd like to thank you for the participation and wish you all safety and health in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, the School of Law of Vietnam National University, Hanoi is the first law school and is currently one of the largest and most prestigious law training institutions in the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Famous in Vietnam for its dynamic and liberal academic spirit, the school has long been a pioneer in organizing research and teaching new law areas such as human rights law, anti-corruption law, law of the sea and marine management. It has also held and cooperated with multiple academic institutions in Vietnam and abroad to organize many national and international conferences on newly arising social and legal issues. The conference we are attending today and tomorrow is a vivid example. The topic of the conference, as you have seen, refers to a very familiar penalty in the penal codes of many countries, which is life imprisonment. Like the death penalty, life imprisonment is the most severe punishment that any country's judicial system can impose on an offender. However, according to recent research by Professor Dirk van Zinsmith, School of Law, University of Nottingham, the United Kingdom. In the world today, life imprisonment has now taken the place of the death penalty, becoming the most common punish punishment for particularly serious crimes. More than half a million people are serving life sentences in many countries, and the figure tends to increase. 
as a punishment, life imprisonment is primarily intended to enforce justice and protect the safety of the community. However, imprisoning a person in hopeless situation for the rest of his life, and usually in very harsh conditions, causes much debate about humanity. The question is whether it is possible to reform or replace life imprisonment with another punishment that both meets the requirements of justice, community security, and secures human rights and dignity. This is a very important question to be answered in the context of judicial reforms taking place in many countries, including Vietnam. And our conference today and tomorrow will contribute to that. And therefore, we have been looking forward to today and tomorrow to hear the presentations and discussions by scholars and experts during the two days of the conference. We believe that the knowledge and information that we are about to obtain in the next two days are new, interesting and useful, not only for the job of each of us, but also for the criminal law reforms in our countries to be more and more effective, uh, progressive and uh, humane. To conclude my welcome remarks, on behalf of the School of Law of Vietnam National University Hanoi, VNU Hanoi, I would like to once again express my sincere thanks to the scholars, distinguished guests, participants, the VNU Hanoi, Vietnamese governmental agencies for their support in the organization of the conference. In particular, we would like to thank Professor Sarah Bidov, uh, Professor Dirk Van Zinvis, uh, Dr. Merites uh, Olea and the Asian Law Center, Melbourne Law School, uh, University of Melbourne, the School of Law, University of Nottingham, the UK, the International Organization of Educators and Researchers who have collaborated with us to organize this very significant event. I wish you all uh, safety, health and happiness and a successful conference. Thank you for the attention. And now I'd like to introduce Professor Sarah Bidaf. Uh, Professor Bidaf is Assistant Deputy Vice Chancellor, International Trainers. Uh, Professor Bidaf has been instrumental in developing and implementing the university's strategic direction for investment with China. She is also Professor of Law at the Melbourne Law School and Director of its Asian Law Centers. And now, our professor Sarah Bidov with her opening remarks uh, on behalf of the Asian Law Center member university, please. To um, be representing the Asian Law Center in the Melbourne Law School. Um, and, and let me please um, give my congratulations to all of the collaborating partners for this very important conference. Um, it, it is a, a program um, which includes um, very interesting papers and some of the most uh, senior and, and thoughtful people on this topic from around the world. Um, and, and I'm glad that, um, that we will be talking about this topic in detail. Um, so my, my main area of research is, is actually on China. Um, and as you will know, China um, has been probably uh, the country that has executed uh, more people um, per annum um, than any other country. Um, and um, it's been very interesting to watch over time um, as the debate about abolition of the death penalty um, has gotten going. Um, of course, there's not a lot of support for that amongst the people or amongst the, um, the, the party state. Um, but one of the very important arguments that has been um, used to try and persuade people um, that the death penalty uh, might be reduced in scope um, with a view maybe to eliminating it at some point, um, is the prospect um, of imposing life imprisonment. Now, China, of course, um, has two forms of life imprisonment. Um, one of them is uh, actually a suspended death sentence, um, and then there's life imprisonment. And, and one of the arguments um, was that uh, life imprisonment didn't in fact mean life imprisonment because people would be able to get parole early. Um, and, and so recently, uh, China is one of the countries um, that has made reforms um, to ensure um, that, um, as they say, that there is truth in sentencing, which is that life imprisonment means that, that a person is not released during their lifetime. And so you can see um, that 
Um, for me, the, the, um, the interesting question is often the trade-offs that are made um, in a criminal justice system in terms of punishment and severity of punishment and types of punishment, which is why I'm so very delighted um, to be um, participating in this conference and delighted that the Asian Law Centre um, is able to be a co-host on this very important topic with people who've already done an enormous amount of careful thinking um, about it. So without saying any more, um, let me please now turn back to Dr. Le Lan Chi. Um, she will tell you the rules for uh, the successful, smooth and uninterrupted op operation of this, um, of this conference. Um, so uh, Dr. Le, thank you. Thank, thank Professor Sarah Bida for your contribution to our fruitful cooperation. And uh, we look forward to our further activity in the time to come. Uh, and uh, all participants, uh, there are a few technical points we need to cover before we get started. Uh, when you enter the conference, your video will be turned on and your microphone will be on mute. Uh, and translation from English to Vietnamese and vice versa from Vietnamese to English is available. After you have logged into Zoom, uh, click on interpretation. If you like to listen and speak in English, select English channels. And if you like to listen and speak in Vietnamese, select Korean channels. There is no Vietnamese button on Zoom, so please select Korean channels and mute original audio. If you want to ask a question of one of the speakers, uh, please type your question in the chat section to everyone. Um, and please note that this conference will be recorded and may be published online after um, at a later stage. And please uh, ensure very appropriate lighting so that your face can be seen on camera. This is better achieved if the light uh, coming uh, in, in from your computer. Uh, and for speakers, uh, when it is your turn to speak, please make sure your video is turned on and unmute your microphone. Uh, click on unmute in the bottom left hand corner and the chairperson of each session will first introduce the paper in the session. Uh, you should speak uh, no longer than 10 minutes in total. I would like to repeat this instruction. You should speak no longer than 10 minutes in total. And after all presentation are finished, the rest of the session will be devoted to discussion and questions on all papers. The participants may ask you to answer the questions. Uh, if you would prefer to present in Vietnamese, please let us know and we have a translator available. When you finish your presentation, please mute your microphone. If your internet is unstable at any point, turn off your video at the bottom left hand corner and the quality of your connection may improve. Please ensure that only one connection is operating in a single room. If more than one Zoom session is in operation, it will cause feedback and interfere with the connections. Uh, thanks for listening, and now we will move on to the first session. And now I give the floor to Professor Sarah to chair the first session. Professor Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Le Lan Chi. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this first session, and I'm also very grateful to you um, for, for reading out the instructions um, to participants um, and explaining them so clearly. And so that means I will not repeat them. Um, let me just add though, um, that uh, for each speaker in this session, um, it will be um, a 10 minute presentation. Um, I will give you a warning at eight minutes. 
Um, and, and then I will ruthlessly cut you off at 10 minutes. Please don't take offence. Um, the idea is that if every speaker speaks for only 10 minutes, then we have time for very important conversation, dialogue, question and answers at the end of the session. If you have a question, um, please write it in the chat um, and um, we will read them out um, in order. When you write your question in the chat, um, please indicate to whom that question is addressed, if anyone in particular. Um, so let me um, now say welcome to the first session, uh, Introducing Life Imprisonment in Asia. In this session, we have four papers. The first um, is by Professor Dirk Fansal smith um, who will speak on Asian life imprisonment in worldwide perspective. The second by Professor Shinichi Ish um, Ishizuka uh, from Ryukyu University in Japan, a choice by lawmakers and lawyers in the retentionist country. Which is more cruel and unusual, life in prison without parole or the death penalty? The third paper by Ms. Manjurima Danuka from the Prison Reforms Program, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative in India, will we'll speak on a life without hope, other, the other death penalty. And finally, we have a presentation um, which is contributed to by three um, um, professors from the Vietnam National University School of Law in Hanoi but will be presented by Associate Professor uh, Nguyen Ngoc Chi. Um, and the topic of that is life imprisonment in Vietnam, a need for reform. Now, I've been asked to give a, a one or two minute um, overview of these papers. And as I read them, I thought they all um, are very important, um, but I could discern a number of themes. The first um, is, is that that um, reforms to death penalty um, are very closely connected um, to life imprisonment um, and that, that, um, that with life imprisonment, uh, there are also a number of very contentious reforms about whether a person gets life without parole um, or not. In all of the um, papers, we, we find a very important question being raised, which is, in the case of life without parole, is this in fact a sentence of death in prison? And that's a very important point, I think, that all the papers address. Um, we see in the first paper in particular um, a very nice account of the different types of life imprisonment. So the ones we would expect to see with parole and without parole, but also introducing elements about the availability um, of work um, and of education, um, about their treatment um, in, um, in detention. Is it degrading treatment um, or otherwise? And, and the other important question I think this paper raises um, is, is about the informal life sentence. And so that is a sentence where somebody um, can be released from prison, um, but then they will, um, after their sentence, be detained on an ongoing basis, um, which I think rightly should be seen as life. Um, and so um, I think that these papers um, give us a really fabulous overview, not just of the world, um, but also of, of particular circumstances in Japan, where we see the availability of parole decreasing. Um, in India, uh, where we see 50% of people convicted of an offence are given life imprisonment. Um, and then the, the ongoing debate um, and controversy about the availability or not um, of remission. And in Vietnam, uh, we see the paper focusing on uh, the impetus to reduce and even abolish either the scope or number of people um, who are uh, imprisoned to life imprisonment. So um, starting from now, let me ask, uh, firstly, Professor Dirk van, um, van Sale-Smith uh, to present his paper. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, again. Um, I should say immediately that I'm doing my presentation together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Catherine Appleton, and we'll try and divide it more or less equally. Um, could I have the uh, first slide, please? Excellent. Well, there, there you can see the title of the paper, um, who we are and where we are at the moment. Um, what I want to do in this paper, and you can go to the second slide, please, is, uh, is to look at what we know about life imprisonment in Asia in the context of our attempt to understand life imprisonment as a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Third slide, please. Um, and because this is the very first paper, I want to spend a little bit of time on getting the conceptual framework of life imprisonment clear. When we started our work, one of the most difficult things was to decide exactly what do we mean by life imprisonment. If you look around the world, there are problems of language, and there are simply conceptual problems. People look at these things differently. So after a long debate, um, Catherine and I came up with a definition. Life imprisonment is a sentence following a criminal conviction, which gives the state the power to detain a person in prison for life. That is until they may die there in prison. And this is an enormously strong power. But when we started looking at, at a bit more closely, we realized that one had to draw some distinctions. And the first distinction was between formal life sentences and informal life sentences. A formal life sentence we define very simply as where the court says, we are sentencing you to life in prison. And courts around the world say that often, dare I say, too often. But the second one was where the sentence met our definition, but the court did not say that. The court says something like, I'm sentencing you to 100 years in prison. And there are countries that have sentences like that. Um, in these cases, too, we are really looking at something which can keep people in prison can give state, the state the power to keep people in prison until they die there. And we realized we need to study them too. But this, these distinctions were not enough. We then felt we had to look at formal life sentences more closely. And there the first distinction was between the two items in the middle of your screen, LWAP, life without parole, and life with parole. These are essentially American terms. They've, they've gradually been applied around the world. Life without parole means what it says. It means that someone gets a life sentence and there's no routine prospect of their sentence being reviewed and they're being released. Life with parole means that they get a life sentence, but there is a routine prospect of a parole board or someone considering their release um, uh, lay down in law. But again, when we looked at it in even more depth, this wasn't enough either. So we realized that there was, in a very few countries, there was a truly irreducible life without parole. What that means is that in some countries, they've gone as far as saying, not even the king, not even the sultan, not even the president can use their powers to release people. And they've written this into their laws and in one or two cases into their constitutions. That's the very, very most severe you can get. And then we noticed something very interesting was that there were a few countries in the world where in some or indeed all life sentences, the court says we sentenced you to a life sentence, but people knew that there was some other law somewhere tucked away in the back office, which guaranteed their release after 20 or 30 years. Now this doesn't meet our definition, but nevertheless, people who were being told they're getting life imprisonment so we refer to these as symbolic life sentences. And I'll explain to you in a minute that in Asia, these have played an important role. And then below the line, we also wanted to look at, again, at informal life sentences. And we found there are really two kinds. The one is the one I've mentioned already, 100 years. That is clearly a life sentence. It's not called that, but it's simple. But you could have a case where someone gets five years for fraud, but on 20 counts of fraud, and they are run what lawyers call consecutively. So that gives you a 100-year sentence as well. 
Do we have any of those? And then a larger category, post-conviction indefinite detention. That's where we impose a sentence and then we say, well, in addition, we may keep you for longer. And you say, how long? You say, well, indefinitely. Where that happens post-conviction, we regard that as a life sentence too. The best example is the country where Catherine lives, where they have no life sentences, but they do have provision for keeping very bad or very dangerous people for longer periods. And this is the little framework that we've used. It's our framework. You may disagree with it, but um, it does give us some way of understanding the question around the world. Now, what do we know about where we find these things in Asia? Could I have the next slide, please? Well, this is not an Asian slide. It's a slide of the whole world. Um, but it may give you some indication of the position in Asia. Very briefly, of the 32 countries that we identify as Asia, almost all of them have life imprisonment of some kind. The only definite exception still is the enclave of Macau, which like all former Portuguese colonies has no life imprisonment. Portugal doesn't have life imprisonment or death either. Our studies show Uzbekistan and maybe Afghanistan don't have life. Well, I'm not so sure. We would have to research that in more detail before we can say that confidently. What you do see from this is that um, there are some countries where there are stripes. And these are countries which have both LWAP and life, um, uh, that is life without parole and life with parole. India and China are incredibly important examples here because as you also hear from Agrumina, um, India has re relatively recently introduced life without parole, China um, also, and we don't know yet what influence that's going to have. Then down at the bottom, we also have, and I'm delighted, so we have participants from Australia and New Zealand, not technically life countries, but they um, too have interesting variations. Finally, there's some patterns one can identify. Um, symbolic life is found in quite a lot of, uh, of, of, of Asian countries, Bangladesh, in um, Malaysia, um, one, and one or two others. All of them are former British colonies. And it'd be very interesting to see why they've ended up with this and how they've battled in many instances in Singapore, for example, to get away from this. Something worth following up. There are other patterns that are emerging too, and which need more study. Um, if you look at Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and so on, you'll find that typically they have a pattern where people are kept in solitary confinement or semi-solitary confinement for the first 10 years of their sentence of life. When you look more closely, that was the pattern in the Soviet Union, and this remains, and Catherine will say something more about it in a moment. And there may be more patterns. Um, several, uh, several Asian countries have inherited essentially German penal codes. And it's interesting to look at the parallel there of countries where um, they follow that code. The Germans have abolished, uh, but we haven't. I'll stop at once to at least give Catherine a chance to say something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jake, and thanks, Catherine, for doing the slides. Next slide, please. Um, so just at this point in the paper, I want to give you a sense of our new numbers. Um, we're in the process of doing a second survey on life imprisonment around the world. We have our figures from 2014, but now we're collating figures, as some, of you, as some of you know, on 2020. So this slide essentially provides a snapshot of life sentence prison populations from 10 Asian countries from which we've received figures um, from our original 2014 survey, excluding Taiwan. You'll be able to see that on the, on the screen there. And in some instances, we now have our 2020 survey. These are, of course, preliminary findings, and we're still waiting information from um, a number of Asian countries. Um, and some countries have been able to provide a survey response, but unfortunately, no population figures are publicly, publicly available, as these uh, data, much like the death penalty data, are um, remain a state secret. So from the countries where we received both 2014 and 20 day, 2020 data, <coughs> You can see there has been an increase in the number of licensed prisoners across all countries since 2014, except for Japan. As we've already heard, India had the largest uh, total of licensed prisoners. But when we consider the number of inhabitants, Thailand has had the largest life prisoner population rate 
uh, per 100,000 country population in 2020, though we're still waiting figures from uh, Nepal and elsewhere. Significantly, just if I could say from a slide, in Japan, the number of life sentence prisoners has been decreasing since 2014, together with their overall prison population. Next slide, please. I suspect we have very little time, but I'll just very, very quickly on here. We've just listed here our top 10 uh, total numbers and also the top 10 in terms of increase between 2014 and 2020. And you can see that while India makes it into our top 10 total numbers, the rate of growth since 2014 in India is not as significant as in Thailand and Kyrgyzstan in terms of Asian countries. So between 2014 and 2020, the life sentence prison population increased by, has increased by 51% in Thailand, 20% in Kyrgyzstan, and by only 7% in India. I can add that. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide essentially shows an overview of the broad categories of offences for which formal life sentences can be imposed in Asia. We know that in most countries, life imprisonment can be imposed for the most serious offences, that's crimes against the person, homicide, murder, and so on, crimes against the state, and war-related crimes, so no surprises there. But significantly, in at least nine countries in Asia, life imprisonment is a possible sentence for drug related offences, which contrast greatly with other regions such as Europe. Um, other offences for which life sentences can be imposed include crimes against property, environmental crimes and financial crimes such as fraud. However, an important point here is that this presents quite a distorted picture because much of the information is concerned with what offences are on the books within each country rather than what happens in practice. So we know, for example, in England and Wales, there are at least 50 crimes that can attract a life sentence, but they very rarely do. So finding out about the practice of life imprisonment is also crucial. Next slide, please, Catherine. So far, we've briefly touched upon the imposition of life, um, the numbers and the type of offences, but now um, I just want to briefly summarise um, something about the implementation of life sentence systems. What is it really like to serve a sentence? And in our, so, um, our study in 2014, two worrying issues emerged. Firstly, life sentence prisoners are often subjected to heightened security measures compared to other prisoners and routinely segregated on the basis of their sentence. And secondly, life sentence prisoners are often living in poor regimes, including poor living conditions or excluded from work or rehabilitation programs as an additional punishment compared to other prisoners. And in some um, countries, a solitary confinement regime is automatically imposed at the start of the life sentence, or even for the whole of the sentence, where life sentence prisoners spend, are spending up to 23 hours a day in their cells. And then when we look at the published accounts um, that are available from lifers, and it's quite difficult to get hold of published accounts from Asian life sentence prisoners, um, or, or collect findings on, on what they're experiencing, it has become clear from what we know so far that the so-called pains of imprisonment or deprivations of imprisonment are particularly heightened for this group of prisoners, primarily due to the indeterminate nature of the sentence, which is so unique to life imprisonment. And I put two quotes on the slide there, which I won't refer to now, but you can see for yourselves. Next slide, please, Catherine. Just to highlight this point, um, I've chosen Kazakhstan to look uh, closely at um, in terms of a life sentence regime. Um, both Dirk and myself on different occasions have visited um, prison staff there and life sentence prisoners. And we've uh, worked with their prison officials on um, training them in international standards on life imprisonment. But it's also an interesting example because it's one of those countries who, where when they abolished the death penalty, they really didn't know what to do with prisons who were serving a, life, a sentence of death and simply imposed whole life sentences. However, individuals sentenced to life after the abolition can be considered for parole after 25 years. So there are two parallel systems with 26 prisoners serving whole life sentences at the time that we did our first survey and 96 serving uh, life with parole. But what's significant for all life is, is they start their sentence subject to a very harsh or a so-called strict regime. Um, a prisoner can eventually move from the strict regime to a lower security regime after serving at least 10 years of imprisonment. However, the 26 men who are serving whole life sentences may never move from 
the strict regime, which is one of being in a cell with two to three prisoners, semi-solitary confinement, 1.5 hour walk per day, two short visits per year, and one parcel per year. And the, 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 crucially, what we found is that this is a similar model that's been adopted by a number of other former Soviet Union countries, whereby life sentence prisoners are routinely segregated from other prisoners and subjected to um, austere regimes for at least the first 10 years. A very worrying finding indeed. And next slide, please, Catherine. And I'll hand this one back to Jack to conclude. Okay. Please, um, can, you can, you can you finish quickly, please? Yeah, sorry, we've ever said I will come a bit, so just a few quick conclusions. We really need to know more about life imprisonment in Asia. Why? Well, one reason Sarah gave at the beginning so that we can understand the relationship between life and death sentences. But as the world gets more integrated, it's incredibly important when you look at extradition, when you look at the transfer of sentence prisoners. We need to know these things in order to be able to work together between countries. And finally, something we haven't had a chance to discuss, we need to develop a set of standards for critiquing life imprisonment. And human rights law in this area is only gradually emerging. And we need to talk about these standards as they emerge in your countries too. Thank you very much. And thank you for allowing us a bit of extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let me ask, uh, turn to Professor Shinichi Ishizuka from Ryukyu University in Japan um, to present. Thank you very much, Chair. And then uh, call for me and uh, Derek. And uh, I met uh, Derek and, uh, 30 years ago already. So, and uh, my tema is a uh, choice by uh, lawmakers and lawyers in the retention country. Japan is now a retention society. And uh, yeah, sorry, and uh, uh, we have a death penalty, and uh, which is a more cruel and usual life imprisonment with a parole, airwap, or death penalty. This is my tema. I'm a uh, uh, director of a uh, criminology research center at Duke of University. So, and it is a survey on an attitude toward the death penalty. Very interesting. Uh, the question, there are written such three uh, and options on, on the system on this penalty, with which of them to uh, you agree? Yeah, abolitionist is in Japan in the only in the nine percent. Retentionist and more than an 80 percent. It is a very important point. And the second question, if Arab as a new system and it could be introduced. So the same of this penal, uh, the system of this penalty would be abolished or it should be and uh, detained. So, and uh, any death penalty should be abolished. Abolitionist is an, uh, is an uh, 35%, increasing 26%. It is very important point. So, and this is an illegal status in the rifles in Japan. And Japan is already in the direct and, uh, and explained. Yeah, an LWP state. Every life imprisonment with parole, it's okay. But it is in the dual. Legally, it is incorrect. But indeed, de facto, it is different from an legal systems. For example, yeah, this one. This is a uh, contemporary situation and rifles in Japan. It is a uh, red, is a uh, life imprisonment and sentenced. And the blue is death penalty, sentenced. So this is an, an uh, so, and uh, this, an, uh, yeah, at the beginning of the 2002 and about in uh, 2010, these in the 10 years, and so and such a life imprisonment increasing. And now death penalty too. This is a so-called and penal populism influenced in the Japanese and penal policy. So it's very important. It is number at that time. Life imprisonment and sentenced 
more than 135. Now, 2019, only 60, 16. So it is very important point. Second is in the release, parole. So in the 19 and the 17 per year, on the more than an 100 an inmate is paroled. But in the, yeah, decreasing, drastically decreasing, especially in the yeah, uh, 19th, 1919s, and the drastically and decreasing. But in it, so in the 20 and 2000, at the beginning, from at the beginning of 2000, a little bit in the increasing. As a result, now in Japanese and the prison, and the totally, there yeah, are uh, more than and about and 1,800 and uh, rifles. So this is a uh, uh, term of an uh, incarceration. And uh, uh, less than uh, 10 years is about yeah, 600. One third. The another is uh, more than uh, 10 years in prison. It's important in Japan and legally it is possible to be paroled after incarceration in 10 years. Yeah, this and these in uh, uh, about uh, 1,200 people and two thirds of an rifles has a right to be released. This is in the Japanese and the prison, the picture. It is a visiting room. This is an uh, uh, commodate. This is an isolated room. So this is an uh, factory and so on. Now, important is this scene. A lot of an, uh, patient inmate, the old people. Yeah, it is an uh, age in Japan, the rifles. Yeah, and uh, 77 at the more than an uh, elder than an 80 years old. And 70 to an 80 is about an 300. At more than 60 and uh, 460. The totally, totally, yeah, about an 700 inmate are older than and uh, 60 years old. In Japanese prison, usually and uh, classified and uh, rifles to an uh, long-term prisoner. L means, L indicate, that means uh, 10 years or more. And A is a uh, without advanced criminal and tendencies. First time in prison or a, a member of an uh, organized crime, Yakuza member. It is isn't classified and B. This is an uh, uh, institution and a prison. And so in a long term, prisoners incarcerated, for example, this in Hokkaido, Asahikawa, this is Gifu, uh, uh, Tokushima, uh, and uh, then Gifu and Tokushima and uh, uh, Kumamoto and LB indicators. And so, and relatively and uh, uh, non criminally in uh, Okayama and uh, so called in uh, Okayama and Chiba, and the two institutions. So, what is important in the, to uh, reform and Japanese and such systems? And uh, the rifles incarcerated and in, uh, uh, this and uh, institute and uh, to life, to death, and he help to and uh, stay in the same prison, LB or LA. It is very important, very, very and uh, difficult, problematic, and uh, serious problems. The life is not 
and unchanging, such an uh, situation and the image and more and more prisonized. The soul and the more than and the soul and the elder than and the six years old, he has no family. It is no and a chance. He has no chance to be paroled because and the parolees have to an uh, acceptable and person or family or a parent and so on. So probably they have to and live in uh, prison to death. So, and my and the proposal is, we have to, we can then change the situation and the four and the rifles. The introduce and the flexible and the systems. At first, and the normal and security and the prison, and the, at first and the, uh, maximum security prison LB, and then and what ten years and LA and the normal security prison and so and the low security prison and the gradually so such, such and the systems we can and introduce or an the open prison so and more than an 80 years old and um, rifle should be an in an open prison or halfway house it is my pro proposal so and it is in the conclusion and on, the, on one hand, and there were the researchers who say that the life in prison is the more brutal and than in the death penalty because it is a uh, marathon without a uh, goal and a slow death. Or on, other, or on the other hand, and there were and the prison officials who say, and so prisoners and serving life the sentence with an uncertain on the future cannot be treated and arrow up an inmate. Uh, it is very difficult to, to treat them. So now, this century, and uh, we, we can uh, develop a uh, treatment and, uh, for cancer patient. Cancer has become a uh, curable disease and it is uh, recognized that in the part patient and should and decide for oneself how to live and what to do with and their uh, life. Even if and one has only a few days or a few months to live and that it is an own uh, right to do so. In the last decade of the 20th century and the parole for rifles in Japan and became uh, rare and seldom. And the life sentence become in effect a de facto and a lifelong and imprisonment. And particularly in the cases in which the death penalty was and sought by prosecutors in a trial and life imprisonment was and decided by judges. And uh, such cases, so-called and uh, slang name and the Marutokumuki, special rifle. That means, and there is no possibility for parole. So, ERWAP. Uh, just as the consideration and for cancer patient is a violation of their right. It is too paternalistic and for inmates to think about and decide their own lives. Rather, and it is a violation of the individual right to and the self determination to and the design own life end. And it is on our time that I know when one can and decide everything of oneself, by oneself, and for oneself. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed um, for that very good presentation. Uh, can I turn now to Ms. Um, Madurama Danuka? Um, who will um, present um, her paper, please. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, also seeing so many um, old uh, uh, acquaintances and uh, people that I've known after a long time. I guess the pandemic has uh, definitely brought some kind of distance um, in terms of in physical conferences and meetings. At the same time, I suppose it's made more people uh, able to join together 
uh, in, in the conferences that uh, go on. So today I'm going to talk about um, the other death penalty, as I, uh, I believe it to be, uh, that is uh, life, uh, whole life sentences or life sentences uh, without parole, as it is known in most of the other jurisdictions around the world. Okay, so uh, I've put together some figures today. I thought that kind of depict the life journey of a person when they're sentenced to prison uh, for an indeterminate time. Uh, I uh, depict these also based on my own experience. I, I work for the prison reforms program. I've been working on prisons for the past 13 years in India, and I've interacted with many life -term, life, lifers and uh, long-term prisoners uh, in the course of my work. And I have seen impacts on them when, uh, you know, there were certain decisions where they could not be let out on, uh, on early release or on temporary release. And it, this kind of figures, you know, the, I think the fifth image kind of is the crux of it all. The mental impact of long uh, incarceration periods is something which we don't talk about and we don't seem to uh, worry about them much. And I completely agree when Dirk said that there needs to be a lot more uh, standardized stand, standard setting done in terms of uh, understanding uh, what does it mean uh, to be a life lifer, uh, what goes through the minds of uh, the lifers as well as their families. Uh, and those impacts are certainly something that hasn't been documented. Uh, definitely in, in, in India, it has that is a very big gray area. So I'll quickly take, take you through um, what the framework is in terms of a life. Uh, we already heard uh, Kathleen talk about the large number of lifers in India. And it, it was introduced uh, very early on, and more than 50 uh, offenses attract the sentence of life imprisonment in India. It includes uh, waging war, uh, murder, some categories of rape, mischief, decoity, um, you know, extortion. So very serious versions of each crime often contains a sentence of life. Uh, in terms of the other, um, now life in India is... There is always a, a category for release. So even for the whole life sentences, uh, certainly the powers under the constitution of the governor or the president of India still do remain. However, they are exercised in very rare cases. So they can't really be seen to be something that everyone will be considered for. Uh, then again, you have uh, powers. The executive has certain powers for release. Uh, under th those are the powers which are restricted when the court sentences somebody for a whole life sentence. And I'll elaborate on this a little later on. Now, the different type of uh, punishment. So India still retains the death sentence. Um, then we have imprisonment for life uh, with a general consideration of release after 14 years. We have imprisonment, both rigorous or simple. Um, it can be for 20 years under NDPS offenses and some other uh, recent legislations, usually uh, under the Indian Penal Code. It's uh, either three years, seven years, or 10 years, or life, and then death. That's how uh, it is categorized mostly. Uh, for feature of property is, of course, their admonition, probation, and fines. Now, some sentences that the court introduced, which we are, uh, which is the subject of our conversation today, are, of course, the life uh, without possibility of consideration of release till a set period specified by the court. So the court uh, essentially lays down uh, the person will not be considered for release before 30 years or before 25 years of actual sentence completion. And then you have the imprisonment till the remainder of a person's life, which is the whole life sentences. Uh, now, uh, if you look at the second category, so the second category also in principle means that a person is there for the rest of his life, but the person has, the, uh, has a right to be considered for release. There, there is no absolute right to be released, but there is a right to be considered for release. But in the last, last uh, sentence, the last line here, uh, the courts uh, will take away that right of consideration for release. So that's why it's categorized as a whole life sentence um, and which is of course a subject of great worry in, in the Indian continent. Uh, now the statistics, of course, uh, we know uh, India has one of the highest populations in terms of prisoners uh, across the world and uh, our uh, convict population is also substantively higher. And indeed, uh, more than 50% of these are lifers. So that means life imprisonment is a very popular sentence in India. Uh, if you look at the trends, uh, this will also indicate that, you know, and the trends have been pretty much similar uh, throughout. So in 2010, they were 54.3%, and you can see that the figures have more or less been constant. So constantly people do get life sentences in India. Um, now on the, imposition of the whole life sentence. So uh, I've put the figures here from 2016 because it was only in December of 2015 
that the Supreme Court uh, legitimized the imposition of such, such sentences. Before that, uh, some such sentences had been passed, but they were subject to a legal review by a constitutional bench of the Supreme Court of India, which is the Apex Court here. Now, ever since, uh, of course, in 2016, there were no such sentences. But now you can see over the past years, um, in 2017, 2018, and 19, these figures have increased. Now, one of the things here is that the sentencing courts, uh, which are usually the district courts in India, they are not empowered to pass whole life sentences. Uh, what the Supreme Court and the High Court can do is in a sentence of death, they can convert or commute that sentence into a whole life sentence. So there is one level of scrutiny over on whom this, uh, the imposition of the whole life sentence will fall. But that itself is problematic because the district courts can sentence somebody to death, but they can't sentence somebody to a whole life sentence. And um, that kind of uh, turns the tables uh, on, on, on a whole host of things. I'm not gonna spend more time discussing this, but uh, that is something uh, which is up for consideration here uh, when you talk about the imposition of a whole life sentence uh, in that manner. Now the figures have of course increased. Now this is the data on the imposition of life sentences with restriction on the consideration of release. So as I said, the general consideration is at 14 years. But in these circumstances, the courts, again, these were commutations from a death sentence. So the sentencing court awarded a death penalty, but the high court and the Supreme Court during appeal or confirmation process, they then converted, commuted the sentence uh, into one uh, where you could not be considered before 18 years, or 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years as well, and even more uh, in some cases, which um, like 40 years is also listed as uh, some cases, but the most popular ones seem to be 20 and 25 years. Now, these figures also, if you see, have increased over the past year or so. And the 2020 figures are the most interesting because in 2020, the court work was prim mostly suspended. And uh, even in that suspension, in the very few months that the courts actually did function, which was probably um, from Jan to March and probably in November, December, already so many cases uh, were there where a death sentence was commuted. So that definitely means that the popularity of these sentences is increasing. Unfortunately, there are some issues of concern as well. Now, the first mm -hmm. concern of course, is, the, yeah, the, the, is the reasoning of the court. So I'm going to take you through on why the court thought that, you know, uh, there should be such an imposition. Um, so in one of the orders, one of the judgments for consideration, uh, the court said, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in a gist, the court said, basically uh, was trying to convince, convince itself that you can't, if you can't sentence somebody to life for, for like with a consideration at four, and it's again a consideration at 14 years, you know, not that everybody gets released at 14 years, and you have death, then you, there needs to be something in between. But a life sentence essentially is a sentence to life, and not everybody who is considered gets released. However, the court did not look at any data on that. There is no data on that for that matter. The data I presented to you is uh, something that is collated by an organization who works on death penalty, not a life imprisonment. They work on death penalty. So similarly, there is no data. Yet the court felt that a 14-year sentence seems to be highly inadequate for certain circumstances, which itself, because it's not backed by any logic per se, any substantive data per se, is of course questionable. Now, the other concerns, of course, you know, is it really appropriate to introduce? I talked about the sentence. Was there a new, there a need to introduce these restricted sentences? Like how can somebody um, essentially decide when a person will, should be considered? Like, is it true that some, like, is there a criteria that, okay, people, okay, you did this offense now 20 years, you're not gonna be reformed, but maybe on the 21st year, now you are now reformed. You know, those kind of considerations seem to be uh, missing in this, uh, entire thing. Now, death sentence versus whole life sentences. You know, is it any difference? You know, that's like a major uh, issue that we, you know, I'm going to throw out, throw out these questions, right? So, because if there's no research to document the implications of life sentences, it, it's very uh, different to say, but of what I've read, uh, what I've been reading about how the sentences are considered all over the world, definitely this, and even in the presentation before me, there seems to be little difference uh, between a death row prisoner or a whole life sentence person. Uh, are whole life sentences incompatible with the human rights framework? Um, 
in my view, yes. But again, the courts have never discussed this at all. They've always talked about the death sentence. And of, of course, in India, we have still retained the death sentence, but there's still been consideration about what a death sentence means. But for a life sentence, there's hardly any order or any court judgment where they even considered what the uh, standardization behind a sentence to death. Now, is it fair for the court to decide whether a person can be reformed or not, or a period when he is reformed? Now, this is the main crux because the adjudicating authorities being the high courts and the Supreme Courts, they don't even get to see the prisoner. For them, it's just a name. They have not seen anything apart from the document, the name, the docket, or whatever it is. How on earth can they decide whether the person has or has not reformed or when that person would reform? And that, I think, is, is a main, you know, I think that's something which is missing. You know, this human element is certainly missing from uh, this entire entire conversation around life and releases because releases as the norm was the release would come would be initiated from the prison superintendent who is the first person who is in touch with the person on a regular basis and who is probably best suited to understand okay somebody can might just have reformed in in one day of being in prison or a month and or a year you know ultimate object is rehabilitation and reformation any any scientific criteria towards that so that's the point that I really wanted to highlight today. Uh, again, this is just a quote, um, you know, prison and, and I guess all of us work on it. So we all know about what it means uh, to be in a prison. So I'm not going to read it. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, let me turn, please, to Associate Professor Nguyen Ngoc Chi, um, who will present the paper for the team from Vietnam National University. We have a... Uh paper, uh, Life Imprisonment in Vietnam, is there a need to reform? Uh, uh, a group of author, me, uh, me, Associate Professor Dr. Vũ Công Giao and Dr. Nguyễn Xuân Thủy. Uh, uh, we are fortunate that uh, my co-author have authorized me uh, to present to you. I hope that after my uh, presentation, uh, the answer uh, the question will be answered. I will uh, present to you, uh, first of all, the kind of panoramic view on uh, life imprisonment in Vietnam. First, I would like to affirm to you, uh, the participants, that uh, until this moment when I'm talking to you, there is, there does exist still in Vietnam, life imprisonment in the system of sentences of uh, Vietnam's uh, criminal law. The explanation for the existence of life imprisonment in Vietnam's law system is that uh, sentences are defined in various categories and uh, accordingly, uh, they are compatible uh, to the level of uh, crimes committed. So uh, life sentences are applied to the especially serious crimes, not to the level uh, of carrying death sentences, death penalties. So we can say that life imprisonment is a kind of sentences uh, that distinguish uh, the kind of criminal uh, obligations of uh, offenders at various levels. That is uh, a very important uh, reason for the existence of uh, life imprisonment in uh, Vietnamese criminal law. In addition, there is also another reason why working with, why dealing with uh, criminal cases for those who might be subject to death penalties, but due to investigation, they, it is found that only the evidence has been collected only to the level uh, that if death penalty is given, the court is not quite uh, happy with the evidence collected. In a nutshell, the evidence to convict him or her is not kind of gratifying, satisfying to the court. So instead of issuing the death penalty, 
the God is still life imprisonment. Meaning that in the future, if any error is discovered, there will be still chances to remedy the decision, not making them become the victims of injustice. So in Vietnam, maybe for the question is, should life imprisonment be removed or not? I think if the question is raised in Vietnam, many people, including the public, would think that mm, this is a redundant question. Because for years now, since time immemorial, life imprisonment has been existing in the Vietnamese society. And now it's rationality still is still there. The rationality is still there for it to be existing. So part of the Vietnamese public and even part of the Vietnamese legal scholars, scholars of law are also inclined towards maintaining life imprisonment in the society so as to deterring, punishing and deterring crimes. So that is the first point I want to raise in uh, our workshop. In Vietnam, there remains life imprisonment at the moment. Uh, in the 2015 criminal code, the latest version of criminal code of Vietnam, the 2015 criminal code, it stipulates that life imprisonment is applied on 53 offenses, 53 offenses of crimes, 53 crimes, which are spread in the 10 chapters, uh, like uh, infringement to national security, infringement to uh, humans' uh, life, dignity, uh, ownership, uh, drugs uh, related, uh, uh, infringement to the judicial activities, uh, infringement of violation of uh, uh, the social order and so on. So uh, the 53 crimes are spread in 10 chapters of uh, Vietnam's uh, uh, penal code. Uh, it is uh, compatible to uh, the first speaker that in Asia, uh, Vietnam is uh, similar to uh, the situation in Asia, life imprisonment has been applied uh, on various crimes, not focused on uh, some specific uh, crimes only. And based on the 2015 Penal Code, uh, the 2015 Criminal Procedure Code, and the 2015 Law on Execution of Criminal Adjustment, and uh, uh, the Law on Special Amnesty provided uh, the procedures to apply and execute uh, life imprisonment. So here, uh, there is one special point uh, uh, for Vietnamese law that uh, on the 2018 law on special amnesty, uh, it also uh, stipulated on uh, life investment, uh, two types, one which can subject to amnesty, one which cannot subject to amnesty, uh, similar to uh, a previous speaker, right, in Asia, uh, there are two types of uh, uh, life imprisonment. Mm. One can be subject to uh, parole, uh, amnesty. Uh, the other is without parole, without amnesty, as in Vietnam they call it amnesty. Uh, so for one time, they have to stay until the end of uh, their life. And for the other, another time, uh, they have the opportunities or chances uh, to be reintegrated uh, into the society, uh, being released out of the prison. Uh, that is uh, some of the uh, brief introduction of life imprisonment in Vietnam. Now I would like to say about another important point that given the situation, uh, life imprisonment in Vietnam, uh, well, to which direction will it be heading? Uh, conducted research, we have seen that also, Vietnamese law still stipulates on LI, life imprisonment, but there has appeared also the foundations and the roots 
and the tendencies uh, heading towards the abolition, removal of LI from Vietnam's uh, criminal, uh, criminal uh, uh, system. Uh, first, uh, the uh, uh, remedial uh, judiciary is different from the traditional uh, judiciary. It has been studied in Vietnam for 10 years now, and it has been appearing in Vietnamese law, especially in the uh, penal code, uh, which has been approaching uh, the... Okay, I will be very brief. Uh, so in Vietnam, uh, there has been uh, the uh, such approaches uh, of uh, remedial uh, uh, judiciary, for example, uh, requesting for mediation, for example, mediation between uh, the harm of the person uh, and uh, uh, the offender. So mediation is there in Vietnam. And secondly, the 2013 Constitution of Vietnam attached great importance to human rights, saying that the state recognizes respect, safeguard, and ensure human rights. And given that approach, uh, there is no reason uh, to lengthen the application of life imprisonment because life imprisonment is one of the sentences which I, from my personal uh, subjective view, uh, it is even more dangerous and uh, uh, harsher than death penalties. That is the second part. The third part is that uh, in Vietnam, uh, there are the foundations uh, for us uh, to remove, uh, to abolish life imprisonment. Uh, the conditions uh, for that are uh, existing already, are there already. First, uh, the policy uh, of uh, Vietnamese uh, criminal uh, policy of the state, the party and the state of Vietnam, in their policies have uh, said that uh, uh, humanitarian uh, heading towards uh, the goods, uh, reducing the scope of uh, detention or uh, severe uh, ones, uh, replace with other measures. And uh, so the criminal court uh, has uh, some kind of uh, uh, stipulations demonstrating uh, the tendency of uh, such way of uh, alternative uh, measures, uh, humani uh, humanistic uh, uh, judiciary. And thirdly, uh, I would like to say that uh, in Vietnam, there have also uh, been the initial uh, measures to replace life imprisonment. If uh, life imprisonment is ab abolished, for example, if we abolish life imprisonment, uh, we can uh, stipulate that with a uh, uh, termed uh, imprisonment. Uh, uh, for example, replace uh, the uh, 20 to 30 years uh, to uh, buy to replace them with uh, 40 or 50 years. So I think those are the uh, uh, conditions uh, for Vietnam uh, to uh, remove, uh, to abolish life imprisonment. And lastly, uh, to respond to the question that, okay. So we, uh, the question is that we need to reform. Thank you. Thank you for the attention. Interesting uh, paper and such an interesting day, but, but um, um, we don't have time to take any questions now, but could you please hold your questions until the discussion session at the end of the day? Let me turn now uh, to the next chair, um, Professor um, Cliff Lilangan. Um, who is the Chief Coordinator, IOER, to chair the next session, which is Life Imprisonment in Specific Countries. Thank you to all of the fabulous papers um, and uh, welcome to, um, to Cliff Lilangan to take over the chair. Thank you. A pleasant afternoon, morning and evening to all. Thank you so much, Professor Sarah Bidoff. And congratulations to all the excellent paper presentations at which the International Organization of Educators and Researchers. I am Cliff Lilangan, your session chair for the second group from the Philippines. I'd like to greet also the United States, of course, from the University of Melbourne. 
from the Vietnam National University School of Law, as well as the University of Nottingham. Now, this afternoon here in my region, we will be hearing actually five excellent, equally brilliant papers from different countries in Asia, namely from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, and South Korea. The same earlier that Professor Bidolf mentioned, it will be 10 minutes for each paper presentation. We will have five papers this afternoon. Dr. Farah Dusuki from the University of Malaya and Mrs. Milati Abdul Hamid will be presenting Reviewing Life Imprisonment in Malaysia, Prospects for Law Reform. The second paper is entitled Life Imprisonment in Singapore, the Brief Legal and Sociological Perspectives from Assistant Professor Benny Tan, National University of Singapore. Third paper is the Right to Integrate Prisoners for Life, a study during the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia from Mr. Alan Fatshan Ghani Wardana, Islamic University of Indonesia. Fourth paper is actually from Associate Professor Zelina Sultana, of Bangladesh and Ms. Nasrin Akhtar from the University Dhaka, Bangladesh. The title of their paper is Ensuring Constructive Prison Life for Life Convicted Prisoners in Bangladesh. And last but not the least, under session two, is actually a paper from Ms. Yo Jung Jong, Aoyama Gakuin University and Risho University, Japan, Life Imprisonment in South Korea, Law and Practice. Similar concepts pertaining to life imprisonment, like clamor for justice, reform, human rights, among other things, will still be heard in these five brilliant papers. So without further ado, I'd like to call in now the first paper presenters for session two, Dr. Farah Nini Dusuki, University of Malaya, Malaysia, and Mrs. Melati Abdul Hamid Malaysia, title Reviewing Life Imprisonment in Malaysia, Prospects for Law Reform. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lil, uh, Professor Lilagan. And thank you very much, um, Professor Dirk and uh, Dr. Catherine Appleton for including myself and Melati in this important conference. And echoing what Professor Dirk has said earlier, um, when, when I started the research on life imprisonment, much to my dismay, there was close to nothing um, written on life imprisonment. And, and in the leading textbooks um, on criminal justice and criminal procedure, at most only one paragraph is relegated to the topic of life imprisonment. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Paranini Dusuki, and I'll be uh, taking the first five minutes and passing on the baton to my colleague, Malati. Um, now, um, as an introduction, when we talk about life imprisonment in Malaysia, we are, we are actually talking about two main implications. One is with regards to the definitions, which uh, the first one um, would augur well with what um, uh, has been um, discussed so far, that is imprisonment for natural life. For uh, statutorily, it means subject to the provisions of any written law conferring power to grant pardons, reprieves or respites or suspension or remissions of punishment, imprisonment until the death of the person on whom the sentence is passed. Now, on the other hand, when life imprisonment is mentioned, it refers to the statutory period of 30 years in the Criminal Justice Act 1953. Now, on the other hand, when we talk about life imprisonment, it comes in different forms. Uh, firstly, it is given as an alternative to death penalty when um, death penalty um, and life imprisonment are given as options to punishment. The other one is when um, it is the sole or alternative penalty, the natural life uh, imprisonment, uh, I mean, imprisonment for natural life of a person is either the sole or alternative penalty. The third form is when it is prescribed as the maximum period of imprisonment where the minimum may or may not be stipulated. So for instance, for the offense of statutory rape, uh, a person may be sent to prison uh, not less than 10 years, but up to 30 years as maximum. And the other last form of 
uh, life imprisonment would be the alternative penalty when the offender is given royal pardon against a death penalty that has been imposed on him or her. Now let's look at the categories of offenses that you know that come under imprisonment for natural life and for imprisonment, uh, life imprisonment for 30 years. Now for imprisonment for natural life, fortunately, um, it is only, fortunately or unfortunately, it's only provided in a three specific statutes in Malaysia. Uh, a larger number is provided in the penal code um, and, and the offences uh, come in two basic forms, either uh, in two different categories, that is subcategories, offences against the state or offences in relation to terrorism. Um, the, other, the other two uh, statutes that provide for imprisonment for uh, natural life are both statute uh, dealing with uh, aggravated form of offences in relation to uh, firearms. Um, whereas for life imprisonment of 30 years, it is worthy to note that um, it is only since 2007 that the period has been extended to 30 years. For previously, the period was uh, 20 years um, and it exists for a number of offences um, and the increase in the period from 20 years to 30 years was actually made corresponding to amendments which were made uh, to the penal code um, particularly in the increase for sexual offences um, to indicate a public abhorrence of such crimes, um, particularly those committed against children. So because the penal code um, was amended to increase the punishment from 20 to 30 years, and that's why um, section 57 of the penal code was also amended to, to uh, provide the interpretation for life imprisonment to be 30 years. And correspondingly, the Criminal Justice Act 1953 was also amended um, to provide the period for life imprisonment as 30 years. Now, the question on whether imprisonment for natural life is unconstitutional was raised in 1984 by the federal court in the case of Che Ani Ben Itam against public prosecutor. Now, the actual issue, the point of reference that was brought to the federal court was whether or not the sentence of life imprisonment uh, for the duration of natural life as provided under Section 4 of the Firearms Increased Penalties Act, read together with Section 2, which provides the definition, is unconstitutional and violates Article 5, Clause 1 on the right against deprivation of liberty and Article 8, Clause, uh, Article 8, Clause 1 on equality before the law of the federal constitution. Well, the federal court decided no, it is not unconstitutional um, because in matters relating to equal protection, uh, the basis of approach is the identification of legislative purpose and a reasonable classification is one that includes all persons who are similarly placed with respect to the purpose of the law. And the judge further said, the sentence prescribed in the 1971 Act is constitutional and valid. And we might perhaps just add that the existence of executive powers of clemency could well militate against the rigors of the sentence sought to be impugned by consideration on a case-to-case -case basis. And uh, we still have death penalty, unfortunately, for 33 offences, 11 of which are mandatory, um, and move towards the abolition of mandatory death sentence took place since 2013. And in 2019, a special committee was appointed. And um, the study was to review the 11 offences and um, Findings have been made, but unfortunately, it is currently under embargo pending decision of the cabinet uh, due to the change of government uh, twice, really, uh, or three times. Um, over to you, Malati. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah. So um, here I would like to proceed with our presentation to look into some human rights issue uh, from the perspective of international treaties uh, at first. So the first uh, main treaty that we, we would like to highlight here is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And here, um, I would like to highlight that the ICCPR does not explicitly prohibit life imprisonment. Um, I mean, rather, even Article 6 of the ICCPR um, does permit the use of death penalty in limited circumstances, although it does um, encourage the abolition of um, death penalty as well. Um, on the other hand, the legality of life imprisonment could also be argued uh, or evaluated based on two articles in the ICCPR. 
namely um, Article 7, which prohibits cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment and treatment, and Article 10, Paragraph 3, which talks about the duty of prison authorities to orient prison regimes towards social rehabilitation. And um, in essence, we could say that life imprisonment is essentially punitive in nature or uh, more deterrence and um, it negates the possibility or prospect of any um, effective social rehabilitation or reformation um, in, with the lack of hope as uh, was highlighted by the earlier presenter from India. So um, on ICCPR, Malaysia, unfortunately, is not a party to ICCPR. Um, the government of Malaysia had made some statements, you know, from time to time, I've seen statements in UNGA um, or the UN General Assembly in 2013, and even in recent years in 2018, after our uh, general election, there was a move by the then government of Malaysia to try to ratify a, a list of international human rights treaties, including the ICCPR and the Rome Statute. However, such suggestion was actually faced uh, with a strong political backlash as some provisions of the treaties were deemed or seen as politically sensitive or unconstitutional. So uh, regardless of whether those uh, claims are warranted, um, it remains that um, right now, given the political situation in Malaysia, the ratification of ICCPR is hardly going to be um, a focus or a priority at this point, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, era, where right now the focus is very much on health and economic issues. And I think it also doesn't help, um, as mentioned by Dr. Farah, that the governing party in Malaysia has also changed three times uh, since 2018 and due to changing political coalition. So this is unlikely to be the hill that you know, any party would like to die on uh, given other pressing issues. Um, the next one is on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Next, please, Dr. Farah. And here, um, particularly Article 37 prohibits capital punishment or life imprisonment without possibility for anyone below 18 years. And Malaysia is a party to the CRC. And Malaysia has enacted the Child Act, Section 97 of which prohibits uh, the death penalty um, for anyone below 18. However, it went on to say that in lieu of death penalty, uh, which is prohibited for anyone under the age of 18, um, the law uh, prescribes detention in a prison during the pleasure of the king or the ruler depending on where the offense was committed. So um, what it essentially says is that instead of a death penalty, um, a child, anyone below 18, can be held in prison during the pleasure of the king or ruler, which means that you know, the term is not determined at all. Um, and the case will be then subject to annual review, um, in which case the recommendation will be made on whether to release or to further detain such person. And in practice, the term, uh, this, this in reality um, translates into imprisonment um, more than uh, 10 years. So for example, there's a case whereby there were two um, child who were found guilty of a crime that was committed when they were 17 years old. And now they are 33 and 34 years old and they are still being in prison and there is no sign of them being released anytime soon. Um, and this is not something that is uncommon. Um, so I think the last point that I would like to highlight is on the um, non-justiciability of the power and process to grant pardon. So the courts have interpreted this, um, the power to grant pardon for uh, life imprisonment in, or any other sentences. Uh, something that is not subject to judicial review. And this um, has been interpreted as, this discretion has been interpreted very widely to include the process uh, as well as the putting, setting aside of the conviction. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the point that we would like to make. Okay, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. How about a virtual applause for our two presenters from Malaysia?
Thank you once again for the very interesting paper presentation. Moving on to our next paper presentation is Assistant Professor Benny Tan from the National University of Singapore, who will actually talk about life imprisonment in Singapore, brief legal and sociological perspectives. So a virtual applause for Professor Benny Tan, please. A privilege and pleasure to join everyone uh, here today at this conference. Uh, and I will spend, I guess, the next couple of minutes just to share a little bit about life imprisonment uh, in, in Singapore. Uh, I, I must start off by saying that so, uh, I research generally in criminal justice uh, areas as well as sentencing law uh, and not into life imprisonment specifically, but uh, I particularly enjoyed this opportunity to be part of this conference because it then gave me the chance to uh, look into this particular issue. Uh, and like many of the uh, esteemed presenters uh, before me, uh, it may not surprise you, uh, and certainly did not uh, surprise me that much, uh, to, to find out that there isn't that much uh, uh, studied or researched or looked into in terms of life imprisonment uh, in Singapore. Uh, that, that there isn't uh, much uh, data on public record uh, as well that I can find. Uh, I think I'll start off first by saying that in Singapore, the apex uh, punishment available, the most serious punishment available uh, is the death penalty, uh, including the mandatory death penalty for uh, a few of the most serious offenses that we have. Uh, so rightly or wrongly, most of the attention or academic attention or academic commentary uh, has been focused on the death penalty. And I think that might be one key reason why uh, there isn't much that I can find on life imprisonment uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh, so in terms of what I'm going to share, uh, I, I would uh, uh, apologize in advance if it's going to sound relatively uh, boring uh, to compare to some of the uh, presentations in other countries. Uh, certainly, we have not had any constitutional uh, challenge uh, with respect to life imprisonment in Singapore, unlike uh, uh, colleagues in uh, the previous presentation in Malaysia has just pointed out in Singapore, uh, we haven't had, as far as I know, a constitutional challenge uh, with respect to life uh, in imprisonment. So really life imprisonment uh, is really not as uh, uh, much talked about uh, in Singapore. But in terms of some background information in Singapore, uh, there was the most significant change that happened in the uh, Court of Appeal case of Abu Nazir in 1997. Uh, essentially, before that case was decided in Singapore, life imprisonment a sentence to life imprisonment meant uh, imprisonment uh, of 20 years. Uh, and since uh, the Singapore Prison Act uh, permits uh, a one-third remission uh, for uh, uh, prison inmates, uh, 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 accused person who has been sentenced to life imprisonment uh, will essentially be uh, out of prison in about 13 uh, years or so, uh, because there will be uh, one-third of the 20 years. Uh, in 1997, the, the Singapore Court of Appeal, the very famous case of Abdul Nazir then decided that life imprisonment in Singapore from then on will mean uh, life impri uh, uh, imprisonment for the duration of a person's uh, natural uh, life. So that will be the most significant change in Singapore with respect to life imprisonment. And as I will briefly talk about later, uh, there is uh, an option for a remission or review for remission at the 20th year of the uh, inmates uh, serving the life uh, imprisonment. Uh, and that applies to every uh, offender who has been sentenced to life imprisonment in Singapore at the 20th year. There will be a review board that is formed uh, to consider the offender's uh, situation uh, and then make a recommendation to our Minister of Home Affairs, uh, who will then make the final decision whether to release the uh, inmate uh, on, uh, on remission. Uh, and if he, the minister decides not to release the inmate on remission, uh, then uh, the uh, act actually requires the minister to reconsider that decision not more than 12 months uh, after that. Essentially, after the 20th year, annually, the minister will have to consider whether to release uh, the inmate uh, on remission. Uh, in terms of possible punishment options for offences in Singapore uh, for life imprisonment, they are generally the most serious uh, offences that we have uh, uh, in our criminal law. Uh, and uh, much like uh, our neighbor in Malaysia, uh, life imprisonment uh, for certain offenses is an alternative punishment to the death penalty. Uh, and then for certain offenses, it is the most serious uh, prescribed punishment uh, for that particular uh, offense. In the next uh, two to three slides, I'm just going to share some of the famous uh, or, or major cases in Singapore where uh, accused persons or offenders have been sentenced to life imprisonment just to give 
uh, audience members a little bit of sensing as to what are the type of offenses and offenders in Singapore who will be sentenced to undergo uh, life imprisonment. But the first case I'll share is a fairly recent case of Michael Anand Garing, and I think this is a good example to share because the two offenders in this case, uh, while they were complicit uh, in the same criminal enterprise, uh, the first one, Garing, was ultimately sentenced to the death penalty, uh, whilst his accomplice, Imba, was uh, sentenced to the life uh, imprisonment. Uh, and it makes for a very uh, interesting comparison. What was it about the facts of the case that led to the Court of Appeal imposing a different punishment on the two of them? Essentially, the two of them together with three other uh, accomplices uh, had a plan to go out and rob a number of uh, victims uh, in the streets of Singapore. Uh, and they actually started off robbing three victims first and the three victims survived and the last one uh, was attacked so badly that he didn't survive. And it is with respect, with respect to the last incident that we are talking about here. And for Garing, the court found that uh, he actually swung a blade of a parang, uh, which is, I believe, about 50, uh, almost 60 centimeter long knife, uh, violently at different parts of the deceased body and eventually uh, cutting the deceased throat as well. Uh, there was a sure brutality that was exhibited by Garing. Uh, the court found that he attacked the deceased in a totally savage and merciless manner as though he uh, were attacking a hunted prey. Uh, in Singapore, in an earlier case of Koja Bing, the Court of Appeal held that the threshold to impose a mandatory death penalty, uh, the death penalty, uh, is when the behavior or the conduct of the accused person had outraged the feelings of the uh, community. Uh, and because of the finding of facts with respect to Garing, the court felt that uh, uh, what Garing did was so serious uh, that it met the threshold and so imposed a death penalty on him. For him, Bao, uh, he was actually the one who initiated the attack uh, on the deceased. But the court was not satisfied that Imbao held on to the deceased for a significant period of time long enough for Garing to inflict fatal injuries. Uh, court also found that Imbao did not actually have a preconceived plan to inflict the heinous injuries sustained by the deceased or plan to actually kill uh, the deceased. Neither was there a finding that he actually uh, uh, ached uh, Garing on to attack the deceased. Uh, and so the court felt that it didn't meet the threshold. Uh, Imbao's conduct wasn't so serious as to outrage the feelings of the community. Uh, and so the court imposed life imprisonment. And what was interesting was the court bill noted that actually uh, the line between uh, Garing and Imbao's case was very, very finely uh, balanced. Uh, and if there was a little bit more evidence uh, against Imbao, uh, it might have tipped the balance and the court imposed death penalty on Imbao. Because slightly older case of Ng Kwok Soon, and there was a, some disagreement between the accused and the victim uh, over some company uh, debts and the working relationship uh, uh, soured. Uh, the offender uh, premeditated by preparing two bottles of alcohol. He approached the victim and called out to her when the victim turned her head. Uh, the offender then poured one bottle of the spirit onto her head, quickly lighted the tissue paper and threw it on her head. As the victim screamed in pain, the offender poured the second bottle of the alcohol on her body and the victim suffered very uh, serious burn injuries. Uh, here, the offender uh, was convicted of attempted murder because the victim uh, did not actually pass away from her injuries, but the court found the offender's behaviour to be very sadistic and cruel, cunning and uh, calculative, uh, and imposed the uh, maximum prescribed punishment for attempted murder, uh, which is life uh, imprisonment. And then we got the case of Pawanti, and I put uh, Pawanti here as an example because it involved a young offender, a relatively young offender in Singapore, uh, at the time of offending, she was 17 years old and 10 months old, and she was a domestic helper uh, here in Singapore. Uh, she was quite angry with uh, her employer's uh, mother-in-law for scolding her, and she found a chance to strangle the deceased while the deceased was sleeping until the, uh, the deceased could offer no further resistance. Uh, the court also found that she uh, did various things to make it look as if the deceased had committed uh, suicide. Uh, the court considered various aggravating factors, including the offender's premeditation, the state of vulnerability of the deceased, uh, as well as the uh, notice prevalence in Singapore of domestic workers inflicting injuries on the employers and their family members. Uh, so the offender was convicted of culpable homicide not amounting to murder. Uh, and here, uh, she was, because of the aggravating factors, also uh, sentenced to the maximum prescribed punishment, which is uh, life imprisonment. In terms of sociological perspective, really there are uh, two main points. The first is, as far as I can tell from public records, in Singapore, inmates serving life imprisonment go through uh, pretty much the same regime as any other inmates serving uh, shorter imprisonment terms. Uh, in essence, the real difference is the length of imprisonment term that they are sentenced. So in my paper, the various uh, details that I share about life in life imprisonment essentially came from 
uh, uh, information about inmates' uh, life who are serving shorter imprisonment uh, term. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, uh, at the end of 20 years, the uh, review board will be set up to consider uh, whether to recommend to the minister to release uh, the inmate uh, on remission. And in Singapore, uh, if it's uh, inmate is released on remission, uh, he or she will go through a mandatory aftercare scheme, which is a halfway house stepping down approach, uh, where there's a certain level of supervision uh, for them to get jobs and, and, uh, and learning uh, before actually re releasing them back to the community uh, totally. Uh, so those, I think, are the brief points that I would share, and uh, I thank audience for uh, their attention. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Tan, for that very good presentation. Now, in the interest of all those that are watching, there will still be discussion later for your questions to be entertained. Okay, it's Mr. Wadana here. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the time and opportunity. Uh, my name is Alan Pathan Gaiwardana and my colleagues, Muhammad Faisal Soleh. Uh, we are from Islamic University, Islam Indonesia. Uh, I will present the right to integrate prisoner for life uh, study during the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. There are four or five background in this research. Uh, first, Indonesia has declared the COVID-19 pandemic as a non-natural disaster uh, affects several aspects of the world. Uh, in example, President Decree number 11, number 12, and Emergency Law number 1, 20, 20 and 20. Uh, second, the highest potential for the spread of COVID-19 is in prison due uh, to overcapacity problem, problems. Third, as of 18 January 2021, the number of infection in prison reached 1,000 uh, 1,855 cases across 46 correctional units. And fourth, Ministry of Law Human Rights Regulation has issued the granting of assimilation and integration rights during uh, the pandemic to reduce, to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 in prison. In this context, uh, in this context prisoner for life still cannot get assimilation and are limited in getting integration rights. There are two uh, study limits in uh, my papers. First, the urgency of granting integration rights for life prisoners. Second, well, policy on granting integration rights for life prisoners during the COVID-19 pandemics. First, the urgency of granting integration rights for life prisoners. We have constitutional foundation consists of article 28, uh, section one, everyone has the right to life and to have a good and healthy living environment and have the right to obtain health service. Article uh, 28I, section four, the protection, promotion, enforcement, and fulfillment of human rights are the responsibility of the state, especially in the government. And Article 34, Section 3, the state is responsible for the provision of proper health care facilities and public service facilities. In this context, uh, life prisoners uh, have, uh, have a right uh, and have good, healthy, and the right to obtain health service. Uh, the urgency of granting integration for life prisoners, in addition, we have judicial foundation. Uh, those are law on human rights, law on correctional system, law concerning the ratification of international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And we have social, social foundation, the development of human rights throughout the world and Indonesia, international and national encouragement. Uh, thank you for Mr. Alan and uh, I'm going to continue the presentation. So basically from those the urgencies, we have actually concluded that the right of integration must be given to the life prisoners, especially in the context of the pandemic COVID-19 in Indonesia, as well as we have uh, actually uh, noted that the policy 
uh, that the correctional system under the Correctional Act has a purpose to apply the utilitarian approach, which means the benefit for all people included in this context is the prisoners. To, uh, so the aim is to make them back to the society. They can return to the society and they can be accepted easily in the society. And however, in the context of life inmates, uh, based on the regulations that has issued by the government uh, through the assimilation and uh, integration life during the COVID-19 pandemic, first of all, uh, this is uh, the assimilation in, in, the, in the assimilation context, the life prisoners are not granted. It must be uh, understood that basically the assimilation uh, has regulated under the correction law, which uh, uh, stated that that uh, the life prisoners are not included to get the assimilations. However, uh, the integration actually can be given to the life uh, prisoners, but the regulation that has issued through the this pandemic uh, to give the integration and assimilation, especially to the life inmates or life prisoners, are also limited and difficult to grant. In this context, uh, we have uh, uh, research that the granting of integrations can only be done by a prior status change from a life prisoner to a temporary prisoner through a remission or clemency. If uh, we have known that the previous speakers also discussed, for example, in the United States, they argued that uh, there is a concept of uh, a life imprisonment without, uh, without a uh, parole. Uh, and also if we compare to the, for instance, in the friends, they, they uphold the concept of that uh, integration right can be given to the, to the life uh, prisoners. And in Indonesia, they stand out uh, on the middle. So we, we, we do the LVOP, but we also do uh, what uh, the, the correctional system in France does. So they can be given the right of integrations if they change their status from the life prisoners to the temporary prisoners. But the, uh, the, the, the problem here is the mechanism to change the status from the life prisoner to the temporary prisoner is not easy. There are two ways that can be, uh, uh, that can be given. First is through a remission and the second one is the slamancy. However, uh, what we regret here, the considerations that has been given under the regulation of uh, assimilation and integration right during the pandemic in Indonesia does not cover the real purpose or the background, the background uh, issue of this regulation occurrence. That is the health purpose or the issuance of uh, the uh, uh, perhaps we can actually say that to prevent the separation of COVID-19 in prison. That was actually well, my colleague said that the development of a contemporary uh, human right in Indonesia that has uh, made uh, uh, some of a community uh, gave the government uh, uh, solutions and giving such a narrative uh, issue to change the, the the considerations in regard to uh, in regard of giving them uh, an alternative ways of giving integrations right to the life imprisonments. In this context, there are actually uh, some of the example uh, of how the consideration of health aspect can be taken. To the uh, to the regulation in giving the life prisoners itself without uh, without without joining the remission or clemency, as long as it is uh, uh, in a way of uh, health purposes, such as for instance 
we have the elderly inmates, the pregnant women or with the children, inmates with a seriously in a serious illness, and so on. So from those, uh, uh, actually, uh, risk or potential subject to the uh, infection of COVID-19, we can uh, at least uh, make uh, the regulation of the COVID-19, uh, the, the assimilation and integration due to the COVID-19 itself in line with the purpose of the health, as well as the constitutional foundation that has also granted those things as well also uh, in the context of juridical foundation and also the sociological aspect where all the community either in Indonesia and international also support this criteria to be uphold in giving uh, the integration's life for life prisoners, especially in Indonesia. Uh, that's all what actually we can deliver. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day everyone. Okay, thank you so much. That's Mr. Alan Fatshan Ghani Wardana from the Islamic University of Indonesia. Thank you once again for your very interesting and informative paper presentation highlighting things that are happening in your country in per pertaining to the topic we have at hand. So moving on to our fourth paper presentation this day, we have Associate Professor Zalina Sultana from Jagannath University, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Ms. Nasrin Akhtar, Jagannath University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Their paper is titled Ensuring Constructive Prison Life for Life Convicted Prisoners in Bangladesh. A virtual applause for them, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all. Uh, so welcome all. And uh, thank you, Cliff. Uh, my uh, co-author, I uh, firstly want to thank my co-author, Nasri Akhtar, because she allowed me to present this paper before this, uh, before you all. And particularly, I want to thank Catherine, uh, because uh, she maintained everything and contact with us in the whole time. And so our paper, it is titled, Ensuring Constructive prison life for life convicted prisoners in Bangladesh. And uh, in this case, in this paper, actually, we uh, want to share one thing that for life imprisonment convicted person, there, there are no laws, policies, plans existed in Bangladesh for extra care or facilities of those person. So why? we uh, think to study about this matter. So these are our objectives actually. Our first objectives to focus the importance of a constructive life for the life if prison convicted in Bangladesh and to explore the services provided to them through the legal system. And for this reason, we then evaluate our existing legal system, which are related to the convicted persons uh, uh, or those policies or plans um, by which our LIC are regulated. And then lastly, after findings, we suggest that a considered approach for LIC in Bangladesh is needed by amendment of 100 years old of statutes and introducing a multidisciplinary sentencing management system to ensure constructive life for them. And this is our tentative parts or plan, uh, how we organize our paper. And for this reason, I don't want to focus in this space more. I then why we need something more for the life in prison conflict. In this part, actually, main point is their nature of conviction. That is, the nature of conviction, it is said, the whole life, that is entire natural life until natural death of that person who is convicted or who is imposed this uh, punishment of life imprisonment. And this statement is also supported by these three cases 
Ataur Mridha vs. State in 2017, State vs. Amjadali in 2020, this is the latest and then Muhibur Rahman versus state in 2017. So court, our Supreme Court also explained that life imprisonment means imprisonment for entire life. So life imprisoned person should treat in extra way. Then sometimes in Bangladesh for overcrowding, mass release of LIC is common. And in that perspective, authority owns think about uh, rehabilitation. They, they does not bother, uh, they don't bother about their rehabilitation. And then our dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1939, this act, it, it clearly state a provision that wife can claim divorce if partner is convicted seven years or more. So law is also against the favor of the life imprisoned convict. And then without ensuring some um, rights, such as health right, conjugal right, and uh, sufficient fresh room, warm clothes, showers, healthy foods, recreational activities, the right to life which is guaranteed by our constitution, that is Bangladesh constitution, cannot be fulfilled for life imprisoned convict. And there are some other problems. Actually, these problems are generally discussed in many literature, overcrowding problems, because there are only 11 central jails in Bangladesh. Uh, but Two, twice or two times double prisoners are stayed there, uh, 83,107 prison population, which is estimated by March 2021, and inadequate prison facilities. In that perspective, congested environment is another reason, and the most uh, important thing is health issues. And for every 10,000 convicts in, convicts in Bangladesh, there is just one doctor. So you can imagine their health facilities. And more than 60 jails have no physicians at all. So, and the common problem is inadequate sanitation in the existing prison lack of basic visiting privileges. So there is no such type of visiting places uh, accord in Bangladesh or allotted in Bangladesh prison uh, that uh, the convicted person can meet with their, with their family members. Or denied access to rehabilitative programs and authorities corruption. So the authorities corruption, it is uh, too much controversial issue in Bangladesh and for corruption, jail authorities, many persons, even higher officials of jail authority have already dismissed. Okay, these are our present issues or problem why we should focus or need to be think about a life imprisonment convict. So next, which regulations are related to the convicted person, not life imprisoned convicted person. Because there is no separate legislation for life in prison convict in Bangladesh and their jail life is regulated by the following uh, legislations which are used for all even under trial prisoners also. These acts I just mentioned the name the prisoners act the prisoners uh, prisons act 1894 prisoners act 1900 so you can imagine these are all 100 years old identification of prisoners act bangladesh jail code rules for the superintendence and management of jails in bangladesh mental health act 2018 the provision of offenders ordinance 1960 and lastly karagare atok shaja prapto narider bishesh subidha ayin which was passed in 2006 it's translated special facilities for the imprisoned women act 2006 so these are the legislations which are now existed in bangladesh to regulate the prisoner's life and these all acts have the flaws and these are the flaws which we have short listed them uh, not elaborately we told here 
all of the acts have some limitations. And particularly, the Prisoners Act 1900, it has no provision regarding life imprisonment convict. And Prisons Act, these act only civil and non-convicted criminal in inmates allowed to have visitors. Then collection of next act, the identification of prisoners act of 1920, collection of measurements of, and the pictures of the convicts, that is these are only related to the convict identification or ID card like that. And then uh, jail code, this is also a limited visitation rules, absolute work programs, lack of rehabilitative programs also. And then Mental Health Act, these acts does not provide for differing degrees of the uh, psychiatric care for various types of offenders. There is no type, such type of differences. They, they uh, don't categorize that. And Prohibition of Offenders Ordinance 1960, of course the LICs are not allowed. Uh, provision these uh, facilities. Provision facilities is only available for the juvenile offenders and in some cases the female offenders in Bangladesh, but not the female, those are convicted life conviction. And then Karagare Atok Shaja Prapto Narider Bishesh Shubhida in 2006, conditional release, vocational training, and aftercare programs are available to female offenders, but to not life incarcerated female convicts. So again, this new act also avoid or deny to give any type of facilities who are life convicted, even female. Now, these are our findings. Life inmates generally face a combi uh, combination of financial health and other personal difficulties that after SART, tend to create barriers to their social integration, which Bangladesh jail system have failed to address. There is presently no comprehensive statutory framework that provides a consistent and goal-oriented strategy for implementing life convicts, priorities, changing their care, and guaranteeing a constructive existence both during and after their release. Professor, sorry to interrupt. You have a minute left. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. And then this is our suggestion. Firstly, a multidisciplinary sentence management system should be introduced to ensure key facilities such as health checkup, healthy foods, clothing, recreational facilities, and private spouse visiting time, religious learning facilities in order to ensure constructive prison life, and more significantly, education, vocational training that improve employment prospects are essential for their effective social reintegration upon release. So this is our first suggestion. And secondly, to establish an accountable and transparent authority in charge of implementing the MSM system in order to ensure a constructive prison life. So uh, at, at the last, we conclude in this way that a lack of comprehensive sentence management system and accountability of prison authorities made life in prison prisoners' lives more complicated and tied them to live like animals in four walls. So the major reasons for the current terrible conditions of all detainees, including LIC in Bangladesh jails are lack mm -hmm. of basic amenities as well as rehabilitative opportunities. Furthermore, such inadequate prison facilities fail to meet international standards and violate LIC's constitutional rights in Bangladesh. However, this article concluded that a constructive life for life in prison convict is inconceivable with, without enacting and implementing comprehensive legislation for MSM in Bangladesh. So that's all. Okay, thank you so much. That's perfect. Professor Sultana from Bangladesh. Let's move on now to our fifth, last but definitely not the least under session two. She is Ms. Yeo Jung, Jung, Aoyama Gakuin University and Rishao University, Japan. The title of her paper is Life Imprisonment in South Korea, Law and Practice. 
A virtual applause for Ms. Jong. Thank you so much. Thank you. A good afternoon. <laughs> the evolution <clears throat> of capital punishment is a global tendency. South Korea, abolitionist uh, in practice, has the last exec, uh, execution in December 1997. But the death penalty is still alive, uh, still alive even sleeping for a long time. It's why we have no life sentence uh, system at all. Example in this year, and the uh, prosecutor uh, demanded a uh, death to death to the accused who killed three women when he had a target for uh, stalking as well as the victims and sister. Uh, uh, the sentence will have uh, will soon. Besides this hot issue concerning the death penalty, I'd like to focus on life sentence. I hope for fruitful discussion. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, death, the, the death penalty is at the top of the penal system. Execution has stopped for 24 years. There may be lots of reasons. But, may, uh, but my take is that capital punishment itself won't be comfortable with a global standard of developed countries in regard to human rights. The government has uh, abstained, however, direct revolution on moratorium of the death penalty for seven, seven times on the Forum of the UN. In February 20, 2009, the government also refused to offset a recommendation uh, proposed, uh, proposed by the Na National Commission on Human Rights on adhesion to the second optional uh, protocol to the international government on civil and political rights. But the type is changing. November 70, 2020, at the third commission of the General Assembly, our representative turned to vote for moratorium resolution. Changes might surely come. Other cases still see death sentences. Actually, of our 60 convicted to death, 56 are civilian and four are military personnel, and they are still alive in prison. Mm -hmm. Our research of 2002 showed that the shortest terms of detained person is six years, and the longest 27 years in prison. It must be too wrong. A judicial decision is very influential and even attract people's attention. The Constitutional Court has given a green light to this punishment 1996 by voting nine against two and in 2010 by voting five against four. Now the three cases will be uh, reportedly decided soon as for constitutionally of Article 41 penal code. The National Commission on Human Rights states is this regard that life will never recover for good ones lost their life as of the absolute value is not extensible of anything in the world. And their life is dignified to human extent itself. The commission also pointed out 
that the right to life is the most fundamental among another, that the state has the duty to protect and secure it. And lastly, that the state has no right to deprive it. On the contrary, the Minister of Justice states that the death penalty is a necessary evil to deter crime. Majority of people are in favor of holding the death penalty. In 2018, the National Commission on Human Rights carried out a research and told that in order to get more favorable opinion for the abolition a proposal of the su suitable alternative is the most comparing for of 2003 and 2000, 2018 power increase of voices of homing capital punishment can be seen deterrence in at the heart Heart of the issue and that sentiment for negligence might of approval the death penalty as a good way for good goal. Uh, from 2003 to 2013, as uh, 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 you may see an increase in opinion for harsher punishment and nearly 60% uh, uh, of a person they were keeping on the death penalty. Seven out of 10 uh, people may approve to abolish the capital punishment in case in suitable alternative to be uh, completed, uncompleted. In such in a case, six, 66.9% of people jump to approval the abolition from 20.3%. Uh, what kind of alternative do they want? Absolution life sentence or life without parole is at the top only with combination of punish, uh, punitive damages then a simple life prison is the sec uh, is the second and thirdly imprisonment with level for indefinite term and lastly relative life prison or life with better find this the uh, lowest support supporters from uh, 2003 to 2005, you may see an increase in opinion for harsher punishment opinions and nearly 60% of persons favor for keeping it. Two types of alternative are on the table. One is the life prison and the, another the same type of accrual punishment with much longer definite term. Compar uh, comparative studies are going on to see European countries for the abolished position and the US, uh, USA in various states system. As the Europe, we are interested to know how the alternative uh, penal, uh, penalties have been used after abolition the death penalty at, and what consequences they make up to now. As sorry, Ms. Jong, the, sorry to interrupt. You yeah. have one minute left. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as for the USA, we are interested in comparative, uh, comparative studies of our ongoing system in each state. Um, as for a uh, life imprisonment of American star, Many exports are in favor of zero tolerance policy, they much like life without better. Problem is the is that loss of hope for behave, 
relation makes it different to achieve the final goal of collection and the habilitation itself. Also, a judicial procedure would face many difficulties in protecting rights of a person contrary. Life with a federal has some impacts of intimidation as it could have, but actually no super due process protection is assured and the judicial errors might be unavoidable and way of free bargaining and long incarceration would impact the state's budget. budget. Financial, uh, financial dis, uh, dis, difficulties are not legally durable. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Ms. Jong, your time is yeah. up. So we have yeah. actually, thank you so much. We have actually yeah. seen and heard five paper presentations coming from five countries for session two. Malaysia, yeah. Indonesia, Singapore, Bangladesh, and South Korea. At this point, we will be entertaining questions. So there are comments in the chat box. So I'm going to invite our dear participants to just read the comments themselves. But we have here one particular comment asking the Vietnamese and Singaporean speakers to comment on something. Okay, so can we have these Vietnamese and Singaporean speakers? I think we had the Vietnamese earlier during session one, and we had Professor Benny Tan for Singapore. Would you like to comment on what is written here in our chat box? Do we have from, I think, was it Associate Professor Nguyen earlier, Chi from Vietnam National University? And Dr. Tui and Professor Giao. Are they here? If they're still not here, then maybe I can ask Professor Benny Tan, as Assistant Professor Benny Tan, to give his comments about what's written. Uh, sure. Thanks so much. Uh, probably Benny Tan. Uh, I think the uh, question really is whether Singapore should consider uh, abolishing the life imprisonment and if I am understanding the question uh, correctly, I think the gist of it is uh, the main criticism against life imprisonment is that it doesn't uh, quite allow the uh, courts to take into account the individual uh, circumstances of the uh, accused person uh, uh, because life imprisonment essentially is, uh, in Singapore at least, is uh, there's a fixed uh, period, essentially a mandatory minimum of 20 years uh, jail. Uh, I think it is a valid point. Uh, it's not something that is raised much in Singapore, as I said, mainly because in Singapore, our apex uh, uh, available punishment is the death penalty for a number of the most serious offences. Uh, so I think it is not unfair to say that for uh, accused persons in Singapore who are facing the death penalty, uh, the fact that they can get life imprisonment uh, to them is uh, the less bad of the two uh, uh, bad options. Um, in terms of abolishing, because the courts cannot adjust based on the individual circumstances, it's a fair point. Uh, I think if the law and the courts and the policymakers in the jurisdiction are particularly concerned about uh, things like rehabilitation, so in Singapore, we do apply the four pillars of sentencing objectives, deterrence, uh, retribution, rehabilitation, as well as uh, prevention or incapacitation. Uh, and for better or worse, in Singapore, uh, the law, sentencing law generally is focused on deterrence as well as on retribution, uh, which means that in sentencing accused persons, there tends to be more focused on the offense itself, how serious the, the offense is, and also how much uh, is needed to deter uh, other um, people in Singapore from committing a similar uh, offence. And so therefore, the fact that life imprisonment may not allow the court to um, calibrate the length of the punishment to the specific circumstances of the accused person is not something that features very prominently uh, because the offence uh, uh, circumstances itself 
uh, and the need to deter others plays a bigger uh, role. Uh, until and unless Singapore courts and policymakers move towards a more rehabilitative model, uh, I don't really see uh, Singapore abolishing life imprisonment. And I should also mention that uh, in Singapore, in our Singapore prison service, uh, rehabilitation plays a very, very big role. And so the Singapore courts uh, uh, will likely deem it as life imprisonment, both uh, achieving prevention, retribution and deterrence, but also a good measure of rehabilitation at the same time. Uh, uh, time because there's a lot of uh, programs, there's a lot of counseling, and there's a lot of um, guidance and supervision of inmates in Singapore going through life imprisonment. Uh, so I think that's kind of uh, my response to uh, a very good question, actually. Thank you, Assistant Professor Ben Tan, for shedding light regarding the comment and for giving your insight based on the legal perspective from the majority of the things that are in the chat chat box. Do we have some additional comments from our speakers from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from South Korea, from Bangladesh regarding the comments in our chat box? How about those from Vietnam? Okay, I think, I think since no one is speaking, I would assume that we have read the comments from the chat box. Thank you also for the participation, for the comments coming from our different participants from around the world. We have here a comment saying that she finds it interesting and that in the context of what they are doing there in Australia, they're way behind the eight ball. Okay, so thank you so much for that comment. So at this juncture, I'd like to thank once again, all our speakers for session two, brilliant paper presentations. We know that if they have been given more time then they definitely will be able to deliver the goods, so to speak. And let's give all of them a virtual applause, please. Okay, thank you so much and congratulations to these excellent paper presentations. Once again, on behalf of the IOER or International Organization of Educators and Researchers, I am the Chief Coordinator, Cliff Lilangan, speaking on behalf of Dr. Marites Olea, bidding all of you a pleasant day. And I'll now move on by introducing the next session chair for session three, Dr. Lelan Chi from the School of Law, Vietnam National University, Hanoi, Vietnam. So thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Professor Cliff Ransom. Um, and now uh, we continued with the third session named Wider Perspective. Uh, in the second session, we have heard a lot of uh, exciting materials about lie imprisonment in specific Asian countries. And in this session, we are about to examine life sentence from other legal landscapes beyond the boundaries of Asia. Uh, the first paper is of Professor John Anderson and Miss Hannah Williams from the uh, University of Newcastle, Australia, as well as in many jurisdictions in New South Wales. After the uh, abolition of the death penalties, life imprisonment is the most severe penalty prescribed as section 61 of the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act. And our two speakers will give us uh, their analysis and comment on section uh, 61. They also pose the questions of what can be done about the section and propose a pathway to reform. And the second is Ms. Jordan Anderson the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, uh, from the case of Brandon Tarrant in the gracious terrorist attack. Uh, Brandon Tarrant is the first person ever sentenced in New Zealand uh, to life without the possibility of parallels. We can see life without the possibilities of parallels as the most obvious penalties and similar to New South Wales, the sentence is imposed on a murderer. Ms. Jordan Anderson argues 
that in New Zealand, the lack of discretion held by judges combined with the extension of indeterminate sentencing into post-sentence confinement, showing the decline of the cardinal justice principle. And uh, we will listen to the third paper, uh, also from a Commonwealth member, Canada. Uh, Canada, the country has abolished that penalty and replaced with its mandatory life sentence with specified uh, minimum periods for parole. Uh, just for this acute charge with murder, uh, Mr. Sebastian Lafrance, who is a Crown Prosecutor of the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, uh, will provide more details about the case of Canada. And the last paper in our session is about lie infringement in extradition cases in the light of the European Convention on Human Rights by speakers from the universities of Passa, Germany. The two speakers from Passa <laughs> when examine the relevant case law of the European Court of Human Rights to have an insight into the view of Europe on lie imprisonment in extradition cases, upholding Article 3 and other values of the ECHR. And now our first speaker, uh, please join me to welcome Professor John Addison from the University of Newcastle, Australia, and um, Miss Hannah Williams uh, with the first paper entitled Murder and Mandatory Life in the South, the Pursuing Application of Section 61 Crime Sentencing Procedure Act. Uh, so we welcome our uh, two first speakers. Thank you, Leland Chai. So um, I will speak to the uh, the paper to start with, and then I'll pass over to Hannah to uh, finish the paper. Thank you for that introduction. And um, also coming from Australia, I'd first of all like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Indigenous lands that I'm coming to you from in Newcastle, New South Wales, and that is the Awabakal people. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and to all Indigenous people who are in the conference um, this evening for us. So in relation to uh, the mandatory sentence of life imprisonment for murder in New South Wales, we have um, been looking at the section 61 provision in the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act for some time in New South Wales. It's been in existence for some 25 years and it has uh, been a source of controversy and confusion and complexity for all that time. It does say a uh, court is to impose a sentence of imprisonment for life on a person who is convicted of murder if the court is satisfied that the level of culpability in the commission of the offence is so extreme that the community interest in retribution, punishment, con community protection and deterrence can only be met through the imposition of that sentence. So there's been a, an issue about the judicial approach to interpretation and application of that sentence, particularly as to the sentencing stages to go through when the common law position, of course, is that we uh, sentence people through an instinctive synthesis approach in one stage only in relation to sentencing by considering all objective and subjective matters and sentencing principles and purposes in one um, instinctive synthesis. So the case law that we've seen in New South Wales through a number of uh, notorious cases that we've had in this state, um, in murder cases there through from the case of Harris through to the most recent cases where we've been uh, seeing the interpretation of Section 61, have uh, considered whether it's a one-stage or a two-stage approach. And ultimately, there have been some differences. We've seen decision of Kwame in 2017, where the High Court decisions in Makarian were elevated as saying that we should take a one-stage approach to Section 61. 
But the other cases and the most recent case of McNamara, which Rogerson and McNamara, which of course is an underworld killing here in New South Wales, which resulted in a sentencing of a former police detective, well, both former police detectives, but McNamara particularly was the subject of the appeal in this case. And in this particular case, McNamara, the Court of Criminal Appeal in New South Wales, approved a differential form of two-stage approach to the life sentence for murder, with looking at the causal connection to culpability factors first, and then the separate utilitarian considerations that were not part of the culpability calculus. And I'll go into that in more detail in the paper that you have. The question that we still have as a result of that is, at one level, there has been a resolution of the approach to section 61, but there is still a distinct lack of guidance in the way the natural life sentence has been mandated under section 61 because of a number of problems that have not been effectively dealt with either at, through the judicial interpretation process <coughs> or through the legislation. So the approach to section 61 is still unlikely to promote equal and consistent application of the law, particularly when the alternative to the maximum penalty of mandatory life is a determinant sentence with a non-parole period. And therefore the courts have to make the distinction in murder cases between which cases get life and which get a determinant sentence with a non-parole period, which is a very distinct difference when you think that uh, the life sentence, of course, which means natural life here in New South Wales can mean uh, quite a significant period of time, depending on the age of the person who is sentenced. So nature of murder as a crime are factors that have not been considered particularly well in guiding the judiciary. Uh, the scope of the, the whole uh, spectrum of um, cases and uh, actions that can constitute murder as a crime, and also the need for ordinal and cardinal proportionality in sentencing has not been something that's been effectively addressed in this, particularly when we took at ordinal proportionality and the next um, crimes that we would be dealing with um, in order of um, seriousness, descending seriousness, would be manslaughter or assault causing death uh, whilst intoxicated, which both carry a maximum penalty of 25 years imprisonment. So then are we, and then the cardinal proportionality issue comes about in being unable to properly fix uh, where the life sentence should be. So we've, the proposition that we put in the paper is that we need a clear discriminating relevant criteria for establishing the extreme level of culpability threshold relevant to the punishment objectives. We make the case strongly in the paper that uh, there needs to be a principled approach to the mandatory sentence of life imprisonment for murder. It hasn't been developed in relation to section 61. We need equitably discriminating, discriminating criteria which haven't been established for, for setting this threshold of extreme culpability, particularly when the age of the offender will be a major determinant in the ultimate duration of a life sentence. So therefore, uh, we also recognise that this is being done in the context of a tough on crime approach to sentencing and uh, a penal populism, uh, which has been um, very much a driver behind sentences like this in states like New South Wales in Australia. So we will move on to the um, proposed changes and I'll hand over to Hannah to deal with the proposed changes. Thank you, Professor Anderson. In terms of our proposed reform, ultimately um, repealing section 61 would have great utility in solving a lot of the issues that is now faced. However, the difficulty is that tough on crime attitude, making it um, highly unlikely that any repeal to that section would occur. So we've looked to the approaches that have been taken in other jurisdictions and have come up um, with a scheme that is largely centred around the Sentencing Act in the United Kingdom. But what it does is it adjusts to um, not necessarily have starting points for a sentence of an appropriate length, but rather it looks at different starting points, which would make a, a murder fit within um, a category in which it would on its face be so grave to warrant the maximum prescribed penalty. 
our paper highlights a number of factors which would be considered. And that would be if a murder had, um, for example, a substantial degree, a degree of premeditation, if it was of two or more persons, if there was a child involved, um, and the other um, more graphic aspects of that are uh, outlined in our paper. But once um, a, a murder has been put into this category, it doesn't mean that it necessarily remains in that category. And it allows for um, in what is in New South Wales um, section 21A factors. And this is factors that may aggravate the culpability or mitigate the culpability uh, for an offence. And what we've done is taken factors uh, which would specifically be applicable to the crime of murder. So as to provide the judiciary more guidance on the factors that would make a murder so extreme um, to warrant the imposition of the maximum penalty, in this case being life imprisonment uh, without a parole period attaching. So once an individual is in this category of, um, there needs to then be a balance of aggravating factors against mitigating factors. And it may well be that despite it starting in the category of being um, so grave, that there are overwhelming mitigating factors um, specific to that offender, which mean that they are no longer in this category and instead are given a determinant sentence with an appropriate uh, non-parole period, which is then attached. So um, what we hope to achieve by such a scheme is to take, um, to take out some of the, the errors that come into um, particularly the murder sentencing, given that there is such an ambiguity in the factors that ought to be considered. Uh, in terms of these factors, each are outlined in our paper, but it is only after considering the subjective culpability of the offence and the offender that if the court is still of the view that um, the only sentence that is appropriate is life imprisonment, can it be um, the sentence that is imposed on that individual? What we are aiming to do with this is to provide more of a framework to the judiciary with a series of progressive considerations, commencing with a characterization of objective seri seriousness, which then allows for a synthesis to weigh the objective seriousness against those subjective factors and to bring more proportionality um, and equitability into the uh, murder sentencing scheme. And we don't want this to be a rigid checklist approach where it's simply um, a ticker box exercise that some may describe it as, but rather having a manoeuvrability in the sentencing scope um, and to provide more transparency and more consistency within um, the sentencing um, which is outlined. So ultimately, um, given that much of this section has been predicated upon a tough on crime approach, there is some difficulty in being able to ensure that there is um, the proportionality which is required. Um, but we think that with the um, scheme which is outlined in our paper, that this will allow for a more principled approach whilst um, ensuring that human rights considerations remain at the heart of a life imprisonment sentence. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for thank you. your very uh, clear presentation. And our next paper is uh, from Ms. Jordan Anderson, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, uh, with a paper, Mapping Life Imprisonment and Indigenous Sentencing in New Zealand, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Kia ora, hello uh, from Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, my name is Jordan Anderson and I will be speaking today about life imprisonment in New Zealand and a little bit about indeterminate sentencing a bit more broadly. I'm going to start today with a recent update on the landscape of life imprisonment in New Zealand. In 2020, a High Court judge handed down the first ever sentence of life imprisonment without parole in this country. The perpetrator of the Christchurch terrorist attack was sentenced following convictions for the murders of 51 people, the attempted murder of 40 more people, 
and he was the first person ever to be convicted of committing a terrorist attack under this country's relatively new anti-terror legislation. To be specific, he was sentenced to life sentences without parole, essentially for each of the 51 charges of murder. For each of the 40 charges of attempted murder, he was sentenced to concurrent terms of 12 years imprisonment. And for the charge of committing a terrorist act, he received one final life sentence. This case sets a high threshold for the use of the LWOP sentence in New Zealand. This man is commonly referred to in the media and by government ministers as quote unquote, New Zealand's worst offender. And following the announcement that this individual had received this whole of life sentence, there were broad messages in the media that the judge in this case had done his job and had met the expectations of the public. As time went on, there were complicating factors here that shifted the nature of the public conversation. For example, the fact that this individual is a citizen of Australia and is Australian born, which became particularly uh, controversial as the Australian government had been deporting New Zealanders with even minor criminal convictions by the plane load over recent years. This friction was then exacerbated by the extreme cost of imprisoning this individual particularly given the projected length of his sentence. He was 29 years old when he was uh, remanded. And a unit called the Prisoners of Extreme Risk Unit was set up specifically for him four months after he was remanded. He remains there today at a cost of 1.66 million New Zealand dollars per year. To give some scale to this number, the average prisoner in New Zealand costs approximately $338 a year, per day and the cost of confining Tarrant is $4,930 per day. So that's a 15 fold difference. This case is extreme in every sense. And you might've noticed in the abstract of my uh, paper, I didn't name Tarrant because it's very, this, this um, slide is actually unusual in that the me media in this country do not use the terrorist's name uh, in, in normal parlance, uh, but, even, even though it's an outlier, it has been an important development that this sanction has now been used once, albeit on arguably our most serious offender. As set out in the Sentencing Act 2002, life without the possibility of parole is the most severe penalty available in New Zealand sentencing law. Though we did a bit of back and forth with the death penalty in this country uh, during the mid 20th century, we have not had the death penalty available here since 1989. And prior to that, it had last been used in 1957. So zooming out to consider life sentences more generally, it's important to note that in New Zealand, judges do not have discretion over this sentence. An individual who has pleaded or been found guilty of murder must be given the mandatory sentence of life with a minimum non-parole period of 10 years. There is a qualifier in the legislation which gives judges discretion only if it would be quote unquote manifestly unjust to serve the sentence. Again, this has a very high threshold. 99% of life sentences in this country are therefore handed down for murder convictions. Although the graph on this slide from the Department of Corrections only goes up to 2013, it represents the general trend in indeterminate sentencing figures in New Zealand. Since the 1980s, the total number of prisoners in New Zealand serving indeterminate sentences has been increasing. In addition to this, the number of individuals sentenced to life has also gradually increased year on year, uh, as have the numbers for preventive detention. Not only this, uh, so not only are there more individuals on determinate sentences, uh, in prisons, because those sentences typically serve long periods of time, but the numbers of people receiving the sentences is increasing. So in addition to more prisoners serving indeterminate sentences and more of these sentences being handed down, the average number of years served by sentenced prisoners serving indeterminate sentences has been increasing over time. As of the 2019-2020 year, this had risen to an average of approximately 16 years, up from 12 years a decade earlier. As more and more people are subjected to indeterminate sentences and for longer periods of time on average, the situation with both life imprisonment and preventive detention in this country is worsening. I don't have time to go into this in detail here, but beyond life imprisonment itself, 
we are also seeing the growth of indefinite custodial options in this country beyond preventive detention and life imprisonment. We had the introduction of civil detention in recent years for offenders deemed risky at the completion of a finite prison term, for example. Similarly, I don't have time to unpack this here, but it is very important to note that as with the bulk of justice statistics here in New Zealand, we see heavily disproportionate representation of the indigenous Maori population in these numbers. The proportion of Maori people sentenced to life imprisonment is approximately 42%, while the proportion of Maori in the general population is approximately 15%. In examining the rising tide of indeterminate sentencing in New Zealand, approximately 11% of the total prison population are now serving indeterminate sentences. It's important to acknowledge the history of penal populism in this country, as set out comprehensively in the work of Professor John Pratt, as well as the way we have more recently seen risk driving penal policy responses. In 1999, a non-binding citizens initiated referendum was triggered through the submission to parliament of a law and order petition supported by 10% of the population of this country. The 1999 general election was therefore supplemented by the question on this slide, a particularly convoluted and complex triple barreled question, which only had yes and no as response options. I raise this here today, even this many years later, because New Zealand is still suffering the consequences of the 91.75% resounding endorsement this referendum received from the electorate. Despite the fact the referendum was non-binding, the left-wing Labour Green Coalition government formed out of that election went forward and passed much harsher sentencing and parole laws in the Parole Act 2002 and the Sentencing Act 2002. Since the 1980s, there have been multiple attempts to reform mandatory life sentencing, including recommendations by expert committees, for example, the 1987 Criminal Law Reform Committee, and the 1991 Crimes Consultative Committee, as well as attempts at legislative reform, for example, the failed Crimes Bill 1989. But rather than moving in the direction of judicial discretion on the advice of legal experts, New Zealand appears to have moved in the opposite direction. This encroachment on judicial independence has also been seen in New Zealand's adoption of legislation, including three strikes laws a particularly ironic adoption given that New Zealanders do not play the sport to which three strikes refers uh, and we don't have baseball in this country. So an odd choice uh, for us to pick that one up. Following this law and order referendum, there was little chance of expert voices or proponents of stronger separation of powers having their voices effectively heard. Over the last decade, similar to what it sounds like in New South Wales, Sentinel events have continued to be followed by legislative responses that take New Zealand's criminal justice system further in the direction of populism and risk intolerance. To conclude, in the lack of discretion held by judges around life sentencing, combined with the extension of indeterminate sentencing into post-sentence confinement, we're seeing the decline of the cardinal justice principles in favor of risk-driven punitive and regulatory sanctions, including the increase in the use and severity of the sentences of life imprisonment. Thank you very much for your time. And Addison, I have given us uh, a lot of information about the story of uh, New Zealand. And now um, I would like to introduce Mr. Sebastian LaFrance, the uh, from the Public Prosecution Service of Canada and its papers named Lie Imprisonment in Canada is a hot dust. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, 5 a.m. here, so that's why I'm saying good morning, but it's uh, whatever time it is, it is a pleasure to, to uh, talk to you today. Um, I'm uh, very close to uh, Vietnam, and I'm very happy to uh, be part of this uh, quite important um, international conference on life imprisonment. So what is, what is quite interesting, I have to, to say from the very beginning is uh, Commonwealth countries have certainly things in common, but in this case, what makes Canada 
honestly quite interesting and outstanding is actually you will know more details at the end of my presentation but there is a there is a case that is currently before the Supreme Court of Canada which may impact not only on Canadian law but also on uh, the issues of life imprisonment in general and it may also be useful not only for commonwealth countries but for anybody in my opinion who's interested uh, in those uh, issues and that's that's that will be a very fresh upcoming decision coming from the the canadian supreme court uh first of all just before i move on to my presentation itself i have to say that i'm not speaking on behalf of the public prosecution service of canada this presentation is only mine and uh it only binds uh, myself <clears throat> so Generally speaking, um, everybody knows it's been touched upon by various speakers, so I will not uh, talk a lot about this, but life imprisonment uh, is the most severe penal sanction. So for, for countries like Canada that abolished death penalty in 1976, uh, the, the most serious offense as in New Zealand, other countries, other Commonwealth countries, Australia as well. So the most serious offense is life imprisonment. What I would like to mention from the get-go is Canada does not belong either to the category of countries that uh, abolish that penalty and uh, life imprisonment or uh, only uh, basically uh, still, uh, still keep uh, applying death penalty to cases. So basically Canada finds itself in an in-between situation about which, uh, and of course, there. this is not uncommon. There are 32 countries in a similar situation right now. So it's not quite uncommon, but it's not the majority of countries. So let's keep that in mind, even though for uh, Commonwealth countries, it may seem what I'm saying, it's pretty uh, blatantly true and not really surprising. But for uh, other countries around the world, this is not necessarily uh, applying. So that's, it's worth it to be mentioned. Um, just a few mentions before I move on to the core, because there's only one point this morning I want to make in this 10 minute presentation, but something else uh, in, in terms of introduction that needs to be mentioned is some countries like Portugal or Brazil uh, provides in their constitution the, the, uh, the, the abolition itself of, of life uh, imprisonment. So there are countries that are not, because Personally, and very naively, candidly speaking, before addressing this issue from an international perspective, everybody thinks their country is the best. So I thought Canada was the best on earth, very naively said and very honestly said here, of course, with a touch of humor. But I thought, OK, we're the best countries. We abolished everything. We believe in human rights. Uh, Canadians uh, are fantastic. Uh, well, there are countries that are a bit more advanced than Canada, such as Brazil and Portugal, that abolished, and that they, the question arose, early, arose earlier by one of the speakers, why Vietnam and Singapore the, do not abolish, and there were a very good answer to that. But there are, and this is the, 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 the very uh, interesting case here, if you look at Colombia, and on the map, you, see, you will see the map down there, that's why I put it there, uh, life imprisonment, that's in blue Colombia in South America, uh, meaning that life imprisonment was abolished. But now, very recently, uh, this year, a few months ago, uh, it was uh, the life imprisonment uh, angle of sentencing was reinstated, was restored for, for some cases, for cases of sexual assault and murders of children and adolescents. So that's even, so what I, I would like you to keep in mind is one trend doesn't mean necessarily that it's gone forever. A country is free to restore death penalty if they want to. That was actually discussed in the political sphere in Canada. Yes, it was uh, about 20 years ago uh, or 15 years ago when the Conservative Party was in power, but it didn't succeed. But there's a, th th this, is, um, this is something that's flexible. It may change. So let's keep that in mind. So it doesn't mean that once death penalty and life imprisonment are gone, that they're gone forever. They can always be if the, the legislation wants to, or the country wants to be reinstated or restored. Uh, another point that's very important for my analysis here is the, the case of Mexico, very briefly here. 
uh, the, the Mexico itself doesn't have the penalty of life imprisonment, but they still do have, uh, using a different terminology, but they do have, person can be sentenced to, to 100 years. So even though they don't use the vocabulary relating to life imprisonment, they still apply, uh, in fact, uh, life imprisonment. So the topic I would like to discuss here is uh, very close to the example of New Zealand. So I'm pretty happy to be in this uh, panel here because it has some, so we'll see later on, but some quite sim similarities with New Zealand case, with the Moss case. Um, so before, in terms of historical background, there was the faint hope clause, which was repealed in 2011, which basically allowed uh, individuals who were sentenced to more than 15 years uh, of parole and eligibility, so they cannot be released. So they, after, after serving 15 years in jail, they can have uh, the parole in a jailability be reduced. So this uh, this case, like this, was called a faint hope clause, uh, and, and it was a, a showing in the Criminal Code of Canada under Section 745.6. But this section was repealed, and uh, tough on, uh, with a tough on crime approach, uh, approach which was mentioned by my New Zealander colleague. Um, the that the less of hope of release. So basically, the uh, the fact that it was repealed has not been considered. And this is this was uh, written very recently in 2020 or 21 by a the, the case of uh, Bissonnette that we'll talk. This is a case that's now before the Supreme Court of Canada, but but the uh, Ontario Superior Court, so uh, Quebec Superior Court, so the lowest court in Canada before the Court of Appeal case. But both are in the same views basically. So this has not been recognized in any decision uh, as being part of Section 12 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, which provide uh, for unusual and, and cruel punishment. So this, this can be breached. Uh, so the law may or any laws may be potentially uh, touched by this and may be uh, declared unconstitutional because it is a cruel and unusual punishment uh, such as, but no, this interestingly, until 2000, 2011, uh, the law remained unchanged. Uh, it evolved, of course, after the abolition of death penalty, but between 1976 and 2011, it didn't change. And, and the point I want to make here is offenders convicted of multiple murders were sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, they all served it concurrently. And I bring it, that, uh, that brings us back to uh, what our New, Zealand, New Zealander friend said, like this, she mentioned a sentence that uh, where the offender was sentenced for the, the musk attack was sentenced to a concurrent uh, sentence. And this is key here in, in Canada. This, this is a very important issue. So this is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom in Vietnamese language. Um, so th there was a change. So now, interestingly, the protecting Canadians by ending sentence discounts for multiple uh, et cetera, act came into force in 2011. They changed the law. It amended section uh, 745.51, and it gives the discretion to a judge to, uh, to, to sentence an offender of multiple murders to receive consecutive parole uh, in, a, in the eligibility period. So basically what it means is people can be sentenced to like, in, in the cartoons, when I was a kid, well, I was reading that and people sentenced to 1,000 years uh, to, to 500 years. So in Canadian law, as silly as it sounds, because Canada is not necessarily known to be the toughest, uh, to have the approach toughest on crime, but uh, since 2011, people can be and are now, there is a case, a very recent case, the case of Bissonnette. Uh, people may be uh, sentenced to more than beyond life expectancy period. So by uh, comparison, uh, a, what's, what really is interesting and must be kept in mind is the case law evolved in the British uh, jurisprudence about the same issue of cruel and unusual punishment when it comes to life sentence. So the appeal decision of the, the case of Wellington and the, uh, and the British jurisprudence states that the preservation of a whole life sentence for the extreme cases 
which would previously have attracted the death penalties for such people, part of the price of agreeing to its abolition. So basically, it's a compromise kind of kind of thing. The decision basically states that well, uh, the death penalty is gone, but life imprisonment is a substitution. So it is fair and fine to to have this possibility of putting people in jail for for a lifetime. Uh, same same uh, approach, uh, same reversal actually, should I say? from the Euro European Court of Human Rights in the Venter, a famous de decision of that court in 2013, it the life imprisonment was deemed to be uh, going against uh, section three of the European Convention of Human Rights, which was basically the similar um, coverage of section 12 of the Canadian Charter of Rights, which is basically about cruel and unusual punishment. But this was reversed uh, in Hutchinson. And Hutchinson, the ECHR, the European Courts of Human Rights, decided that life sentence regime does not violate the Section 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So there was a, there is some evolution in this. So this is why, and this leads me to uh, my the point I want to make is the issue, this very issue of having life sentence or beyond life expect expectancy life sentence, as I pointed out, is has been raised in Canada. This is a hot topic nowadays because it is before the Supreme Court of Canada. There's uh, the case of a mosque attack in Quebec City, which basically shocked conscience. And also, well, it, there's one guy, Mr. Bissonnette, who uh, killed, murdered uh, several Muslim believers who were at the mosque. And uh, it's, it's a hate crime. It's a racist crime. Uh, and also this guy was sentenced to, to a sentence that go way beyond because of that possibility of, of the, 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 the consecutive sentences. So it was, convict, it was convicted to, to a perhaps too long sentence. So even though the, the length of the, the, the sentence of Mr. Bissonnette was reduced by the Court of Appeal in Quebec, and the case is now before the Supreme Court, the issue remains of this year this that that the existence which is i would say personally Sorry, which is an anomaly your time yeah. is most over yeah just give me five seconds five seconds no more so th this comes as an anomaly in canadian criminal law so to have a, a consecutive uh, and as we compared it with uh, new zealand so this is something that that is quite interesting so please stay tuned watch out for the supreme court of canada decision to come out that will be that promising and quite interesting so uh, i'm sorry professor lanchi to have uh, taken too much time so uh coming at you thank you very much for your attention thank you for your uh, very comprehensive presentation and now we move on to the last one we will hear the um, paper uh, live imprisonment in extradition cases in the light of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, from Professor Robert Asser and Ms. Romina Mires uh, from the Universities of Pasta Germany. So welcome our last speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Blanchi. Um, well, yes. Uh, we are the last uh, in this uh, session this morning, and it's my, also my pleasure to introduce my co-speaker, Romina Millis. Uh, we will give you, as, is, as it's written in the schedule, it says wider perspectives, and probably talking about the European Court of Human Rights, at least from a European uh, perspective, is a real wide perspective because, because it gives you uh, the standards, actually, which should apply in, in European countries, although if you have a close look to the jurisprudence of the court, there is, uh, it is not working uh, like uh, those standards uh, um, really want us uh, to work. So that's an interesting point. So I uh, will start with our presentation, just give you some ideas on the question how the European Court of Human Rights sees extradition and life imprisonment. And uh, after that, uh, my co-speaker will go a little bit more into detail about uh, what Sebastian already uh, pointed out, uh, the famous winter case of the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, Sebastian, you gave us actually a very good starting point for our uh, presentation. Um, coming uh, or starting with extradition and life uh, imprisonment, 
Um, there is first, first of all, there is the so-called Zöring case. Uh, Zöring is um, a German national, a German national, and it's it's actually the case is from 1989, but it's very current because uh, Zöring was pardoned uh, in 2019, and sometimes you can see him on German television at the moment, uh, telling his story. Uh, what brings us? What brings that case for our uh, conference? It is not actually concerned with life imprisonment um, in 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 uh, in a formal way, uh, because um, in those times in 1989, the European Convention of Human Rights uh, still allowed, under certain conditions, the death penalty, and therefore, um, sorry, you can see the facts on the on the on the uh, on the slide. Um, he was arrested and um, he served a sentence in UK and um, he was um, going to be extradited to the United States. And what was at stake at this um, case was the so-called death row phenomenon. So although the death penalty was at stake, the court, the European Court of Human Rights in those times uh, rather had to concentrate on the question if the death row phenomenon is a question of Article 3 of the European Convention. And um, um, what's interesting is the idea what the court uh, developed in those times, which is still the uh, guiding principle, meaning that although the United States do not belong to the, to the um, let me put it, to the territory of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, every state which is bound by the European Convention has to take it sentence in Belgium, and he uh, was forced to be extradited as well to the United States. And there, um, there was a shift in the, in the procedure, at, I mean, in the attitude of the court to deal with life in prison matters in extradition cases. Remembering, you will hear that in a few seconds, the winter case uh, had already been decided. And there, the, the European Court of Human Rights took the position that um, that this so-called de jure and de facto reducibility of life imprisonment uh, is a factor which you have to take into account. Also from an Asian uh, point of view, if you would like to have someone uh, extradited to one of your countries from Europe, uh, almost every uh, court uh, in, in, in Europe would uh, have to take those uh, guiding principles into account. Um, and um, coming from my part to the last um, a case which I have um, detected, which might be of interest for you uh, before my co-speaker will go much more into detail on the specific issues of life imprisonment. Um, that is a decision, actually, it's not a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, meaning it is not binding, but sometimes it's uh, also interesting to look in, into those uh, non-binding decisions of the court. What we have here is the question of an informal um, life imprisonment, meaning um, Mr. Findi Koklu, he argued that if he would be extradited to the United States, he might face, uh, as you can see from the slide, a combined or cons so consecutive prison sentence of more than 200 years. And uh, as, as far everybody of us unfortunately knows, none of us will, will be able to get 200 years or will become 200 years old. So that's a kind of informal uh, life imprisonment. And um, at, we were quite interested in, in, the, in, in, in watching the court, how he, how he would deal with that question. You can already detect uh, it, it's, it's a decision, meaning uh, the court didn't see a violation in this case. Um, because he came to the conclusion that the applicant was not able to make a, a detailed and reasonable argument out of that, meaning um, it is quite hard, uh, in, in, uh, at least from a European perspective, to argue the question of an informal um, in, um, life imprisonment sentence before the European Court of Human Rights. So it's much easier to um, to defend someone uh, in, in case of a formal life imprisonment. Uh, and that actually uh, leads to, to my co-speaker, uh, Romina Millis. Uh, she will um, go much more into detail on those questions. So I will leave it at this point, uh, just giving you some guidelines on the question of extradition. Thank you, Professor. 
So um, coming to my part of the presentation, um, as you can see, for an extradition request to be successful, life, uh, the life sentence um, in the receiving state must itself be in accordance with Article 3. Um, the European Court of Human Rights case law is, uh, is a huge amount, so we can, cannot give you um, any details. Um, but we wanted to instead give you a short overview over the basic findings. When dealing with life imprisonment, the court decided that in order to being in accordance with Article 3, which means to avoid subjecting the prisoner to inhuman or degrading punishment, a life sentence shall not be grossly disproportionate. The court never has ruled on a case in which a life sentence per se was considered to be ill treatment. On top of that, life imprisonment must be de jure and de facto reducible. In the court's opinion, a life sentence is not considered irreducible simply because the sentence is served in full. For a sentence to be de jure reducible, a, re a re review mechanism must be in place. As member states have a wide margin of appreciation, the court cannot decide on whether the state chooses a judicial or an executive option. The court decided, however, if a state chooses the latter, it must provide for sufficient safeguards um, for the decision, which can be achieved by making it reviewable, um, preferably by the court. This can be linked to the court's finding in winter. Um, when uh, in winter it held that uh, the penological grounds um, must be in place um, when the sentence is imposed and um, also um, when the sentence is continued. Um, and they can shift over time. So it is necessary to review if they still exist. And if not, and the prisoner is not still dangerous for society anymore, that it, he can be released into society again. This re review mechanism must be available no later than 25 years after the final court's decision, um, as the court had held in the um, international review on the Council of Europe member states um, who practiced life imprisonment. Also, the prisoner must be um, assessed sufficiently, clearly and individually. When assessing the national legislation, the court takes into consideration also um, a member state's uh, release statistics. De facto reducible means that the prisoner needs to have a real prospect of release. Um, in order to, be re to rehabilitate themselves, um, they need to know what they need to do exactly and clearly. Um, other grounds than humanitarian or compassionate grounds um, need to be considered in order to be released, which the, the court found in Marie. I hope that we could uh, give you a brief overview and the good side of um, the court's case law, Article 3, um, which is linked to extradition law. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to speaker for your interesting presentation. And now we can see in the chat box, there are many questions or comments from the audience. Uh, questions to uh, Professor Anderson and Hannah, to Professor um, Robert Esser, to uh, uh, Mr. Sebastian Lafranc. Um, I'm not sure because we uh, we are now behind the schedule, so we are uh, we now have a very few minutes for Q and A in this session. Uh, 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 professor, first, Professor Lanchi, if uh, I may very quickly. To professor Anderson and Hannah, uh, what are the grounds for having life sentence without parole when the prisoner can be rehabilitated? And if the prisoner is innocent, and this could be found through the prisoner's level of rehabilitation, what is the chance of release if they have life sentence without parole? Could you give uh, the thoughts, answer to the questions, please? Yeah, I can, uh, I can probably put an answer back into the chat box, but the uh, essential answer there is that um, really in relation to rehabilitation, it's not a factor that the, the section 61 formulation looks at, it's not considered. So it's really um, a subjective matter that cannot be used to 
really challenge the objective culpability if the objective culpability of the crime is considered to be extreme. You couldn't actually get a life sentence removed because of prospects of rehabilitation, even if you've got a young prisoner, which is what have been some of the issues with some of the people who've been very young who've been sentenced to life imprisonment in the state. Um, the other question is a little bit, I mean, uh, innocence is probably not a, a something that can be looked at unless you had an actual inquiry into someone's conviction, but they're but taking the matter as a, um, you know, someone can be proved to be rehabilitated during their incarceration. Um, if they've got a life sentence, that's still not something that can overcome the life sentence in relation to eligibility for parole. Um, it was something that when New South Wales implemented a, a life sentence redetermination scheme, when life sentences were redetermined before we got the natural life sentence, rehabilitation during incarceration was a very significant thing that was considered in whether a life sentence should be redetermined. And that's certainly something that we've pressed for in other writing that we've looked at, that there should be a, a redetermination scheme of life sentences and rehabilitation should come into it. So, so the question around rehabilitation there is really, um, it's not considered um, particularly much in the New South Wales calculus. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anderson, for your kind response. And now we move on to the next question posed to Professor Esther. Um, according to the European Convention on Human Rights, party members must comply with the convention or are encouraged to sign a bilateral or multilateral commitment in the case of extradition. Professor Esther. Uh, so the answer to that would be they are actually encouraged, if you may say so, to sign bilateral multilateral commitments uh, in the case of uh, extradition, but um, it's always the European Convention on Human Rights that is prevailing, actually. So you can sign as much, uh, can, as much extradition agreements and, and um, undergo commitments. Um, uh, as you want, they all have to comply with the with the framework of the European Convention on Human Rights, and of course we have additional protocols. In the meantime, uh, also on the question of of the death penalty, um, which I didn't mention uh, so far. Um, so that that's actually not a kind of contradiction or something like that. One goes hand in hand with with each other. Well, thank you, Professor Esser. Um, because we are behind the schedule. So the third session here, uh, it has been a pleasure to this session with you. And I want to thank all participants for their contribution and the audience for your uh, questions and comments. And now we have uh, the general discussion. And um, my colleagues, Ms. Nguyen Thuy Sương, uh, will try this session. So, uh, uh, Ms. Duong, uh, please take the floor. Thank you, Dr. Lei Lan Chi. Good afternoon. I hope all of you have just had a wonderful time discussing in each panel. Welcome to the final session of the first day of the conference, which is open for general discussion. I'm Nguyen Thuy Dương from Vietnam National University School of Law. It's such a great honor for me to moderate this panel. At first, I would like to thank all the speakers for their fruitful presentations, which provide us more precise and practical picture on life sentence in Asia as well as uh, places in the, the in the world. So, to all the audiences and experts, if you did not have opportunity to ask questions before, no worries. Since this panel will open the floor for more discussions, so please raise your voice or kindly take us your questions or comment for our speaker in all of three sessions today in the chat box. And uh, the speaker will have about three minutes to answer its questions. Actually, I have received some questions for the speaker from the first sessions. The first one goes to Professor Dirk Van Zyl Smith. Do I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, you do. Yes, thank you. Here's your, here's the comment and questions for your presentations. 
Thank you very much for your excellent presentation and discussions. I have questions for you. Is there any provision in international human rights laws directly regarding life imprisonment? And in accordance with the spirit of international human rights law, we need to abolish or maintain the life imprisonment. Okay, thank you very much for that question. The, the answer is there are not very many clear provisions in international uh, human rights law on, on life imprisonment. Um, unlike the death penalty where there have been attempts to formulate things, these are really happening around the edges. So the important principles in international human rights law that are relevant are those in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which deal with the prohibition on cruel, inhuman and degrading punishment, the a provision which says that this, the function of imprisonment should be um, social reformation, social, uh, social rehabilitation. Um, but much can be made of these. And I think it is very useful for this discussion in Asia to have heard our excellent presentations on uh, European law. Because what has happened in Europe is there are not there, there are some secondary provisions, but there are no primary treaty level provisions. Yet the European court, as our uh, colleagues from Passau have described, have built on primarily Article 3, the prohibition on inhuman and degrading punishment and treatment in the European Convention. And as they've described so eloquently, through the development of extradition law, gradually spread this around the world. So it becomes of particular relevance. Um, and in that regard, I wanted to add something very interesting. Um, a week ago, or two weeks ago now probably, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights accepted to hear an extradition case relating directly to someone to be extradited to face life imprisonment in the United States. The case is called McCullum versus Italy, um, and uh, it is, uh, has been now announced in European press judgments. So I think, yeah, we will, we will get very shortly something which will settle these very interesting developments that we've had. And I should emphasize the development in Europe has been to say that you can impose life imprisonment, but there must always be a prospect of release. The leading case is the one of Winter. It has been limited to some extent in the case of Hutchison, Mr. LaFrance mentioned, but the basic principle remains. And the question is how that is going to be worked out. And I think what we've heard today from the European pre uh, uh, presentation and also from the presentation of our, Italian, of, of our Canadian colleague where the um, Supreme Court in Canada is short, shortly going to hear this very, very important case of Bassionet wow. is just how exciting this area is. Change is happening all the time. And I think that's why it is so important for us to, to think this through. They aren't, they aren't easy answers. Everybody in the world is still grappling with this. Where does human rights come in? But we do know now that at least in Europe, in principle, everybody has got to have a prospect of release and some decent procedure for that. And once you've established that, it does have international implications for the world. Um, and I, I hope it won't be seen as sort of European attempts to, 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 to press their views on, on the rest of the world, um, but rather as an attempt to engage with what is really a very, very interesting development. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your brief but really clear answer. And the next one is for Professor Sinichi Isizuka from Japan. Professor, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Brief. Thank you. Yes, your questions. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's also a comment from the audience. I share your view on the brutality of life imprisonment, but I'm wondering is life imprisonment its abolished? What punishment can be used to replace it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have to explain in the Japanese and uh, penal systems. Now in, in Japan, and this penalty, and and uh, LWP, and uh, I propose in between and uh, uh, this penalty and 
and the PWP, AWP, and so on, uh, new and uh, penal systems and uh, uh, LWAP. Because now in Japan, it is not clear to uh, distinguish and uh, life imprisonment or life imprisonment with parole. And so an uh, discretionary and uh, power by an uh, officials decide and uh, yeah or no, yes or no. That's very and uh, uh, problematic, I think. So and 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 so and uh, yeah and uh, practically problem in Japanese and. Uh, a treatment system or and developed these in uh, 20 years and uh, uh, half of an uh, life imprisonment inmate are an old people they cannot walk in prison but in law so and they are and uh, uh, obligated and to walk in Japan and now when the uh, Japanese Ministry of Justice and some and uh, specialists and uh, uh, talking and uh, about and uh, these problems and uh, obligation and uh, or but walk or the abolished or not in such stage. It is possible to and uh, introduce and uh, human treatment systems. I propose uh, this time not brutal, not brutal. Does that mean I, I okay? <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Uh, we will move to the next one. The questions for Miss Mahirima. Danuka, are you there? Okay, we will be back to her later. And the next question is for Associate Professor Nguyen Ngoc Chi from Vivian Yu. In many countries where the death penalty is reduced, the sentencing of life imprisonment will increase. Could you tell me if that trend is happening in Vietnam? Can you tell me about the application of life imprisonment in Vietnam in recent year? I'm waiting for the responding uh, professor Nguyen Ngoc Chi. I may come back to him later. So the next question is for Dr. Farah Nini Duski and her college. Far Dr. Farah, Farah has also had to go, sorry. It's okay. So the next question is for Mr. Benetton. Are you there? Okay, we will move to the next one. The questions for Professor Zelina Santana and her college. I'll move to the speaker in the third sessions. The questions is for Mr. Sebastian Lafrance. I hope you're still there. I, I am, I, I am. Questions. We have the same idea with the questions uh, that you have received before in the chat box that uh, have slightly different. Like, uh, do you think the sentence of imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole before such a long period of uh, like 50 uh, or 100 years may commit torture to the prisoner since it, it make them lose their releasing hope? Uh, yeah, so, so basically, are, are you, um, did you read the, the decision that I replied to in the chat box? So is that the question you would like me to, to answer to? I just want to make sure I under I picked up the the question properly. I already read it, but you, you, you did not mention to the um, life imprisonment without parole. So I just want to ask for more aspect of the. the oh, okay, the yeah, uh, about the, the, the yeah. So 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 basically, uh, and I I think. Um, the, the the last speaker well, basically uh, that was great actually uh, Professor uh, Vanzel Smith uh, 
replied extensively as a, with an overview, which was uh, very magnificent, I have to say, uh, about the, the approach to these things uh, from the European Court, Court of Human Rights, but also it's the same idea in Canada. The reason maybe I, I can uh, very quickly uh, address it from a Canadian perspective is, as I mentioned in, in the very last part of my presentation, it is quite an anomaly for Canada to ignore between quotes, the courts did not ignore the existence of section 12 in that context. Uh, it did apply the Supreme Court apply section 12 against so basically saying that it is cruel uh, and unusual punishment to to do this or do that with a certain uh, types of law or etc in the case of life beyond expectancy my guess but it's only a guess but my guess is that the Supreme Court because basically the lower courts which is the, the Superior Court and the Court of Appeal share the same view which in very very uh in plain terms is no it doesn't make sense it goes against human rights to to have uh life imprisonment beyond life expect expectancy like 100 years of 150 years so it's it basically feels like western movies where people are sentenced to too much time um so this is this is what i would say this is my guess for what is upcoming but as Professor Venza Smith mentioned, this is something to be looking like, not only for Canada. Okay, so this is a very, very important decision for the issues that will be discussed. Supreme Court of Canada is cited by various countries. So I don't want to be chauvinistic. I am not. I'm absolutely not. But this decision is going to be key, actually, in various aspects. And maybe perhaps will also impact other countries in Europe or even Asia, potentially, because that's going to be a, a major issue that will be uh, discussed. So uh, this this is what I could say uh, summarily about this uh, th this issue. But of course, I'm happy to answer more specific questions. I hope it helps. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I just have received more, more questions for Professor Robert Esser from Germany. Uh, here's your questions. So the European currently have a policy not to extradite criminal to countries where the death penalty and torture are still in practice. This has great human rights implications, but, but make it difficult to developing countries to track down corrupt uh, offenders who have fled abroad. Assuming that the EU now extend that non-conducting provision to lie imprisonment, it will make it more difficult for developing country to catch corrupt people to, who have fled abroad. Profess, uh, please comment, please uh, give your opinion about this comment. Hopefully, I, I, hopefully I got it completely. Um, yeah, well, it's it's uh, there are two, two 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 sides of the medal actually. That means to to um, sharpen the law, uh, the material substantive law does not mean uh, that you should also uh, question your standards of extradition and and your standards of of uh, life imprisonment. That means um, even if you um, invent some laws where uh, life imprisonment. Um, cases will be will become um, more in the future. That does not mean that the European Court of Human Rights would um, um, change its standards on on life imprisonment. Uh, if I fully got it, uh, so of course it, it it will probably become a little bit more difficult to 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 extradite those offenders. Um, but still, I mean, that's that's why human rights uh, boundaries are there. So um, that means to set limits uh, also in uh, to to states which are in favor of um, developing their substantive national laws and extradition extradition proceedings. We have this in in Europe as well. We have this European arrest warrant, and there are several cases at the European Court of Human Rights where the European C Court of Human Rights has has to set the, the limits also to this extradition uh, system in the European Union. So this is how how systems work together. Thank you for your answer. And uh, actually. 
corruption is is uh, is really really a, a serious problem in the developing country, and the offender or often uh, flee to the to the other country to avoid the punishment. Uh, thanks for your comment. So it's running out of time for this panel. I would like to thank all the speaker as well as the audience for your contribution for this panel. Please do not forget to join us on the second day of the conference tomorrow. Thanks again, stay safe and see, see you again. <laughs>